In this episode, I host a dialogue between Daniel Ingram and Damarato on the question, is there magic in the Dharma? Daniel Ingram is a contemporary Buddhist author who controversially declared himself to be an arhat, one of the highest spiritual attainments in Buddhism, challenging cultural taboos against disclosing one's enlightenment. Damarato is a lineage teacher in the Thai Buddhist tradition, a student of the famous meditation master Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, and is known for his unique one-on-one -on -one teaching style conducted over Skype. In this episode, Daniel and Damarato discuss the pros and cons of magical experiences, how to develop siddhis and their dangers, and whether these topics should even be discussed in public. They debate the differences between their own teaching approaches, the approaches of the Burmese and Thai meditation methods, and the importance of a close relationship with the teacher. Daniel and Damarato also acknowledge each other, decrypting the ways in which they signal recognition of others' spiritual attainments, and describe how to recognize an enlightened teacher. So without further ado, Daniel Ingram and Damarato. Daniel Ingram and Damarato, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be here. Thank you to invite. So today I'm very excited about this episode, this recording here. Uh, we're going to have a discussion between Daniel and Damarato on the question, is there magic in the Dharma? Now, I've interviewed both Daniel and Damarato several times on the podcast in the past, and I will include a link to all of those episodes in the show notes below. And actually, uh, we've covered some uh, related themes, but I don't think we've ever really come quite to the point of this question in particular. The format is going to be Daniel and Damarato will have 15 minutes each uninterrupted to make an address on the question, is there magic in the Dharma? After that, it'll be opened up for a dialogue between them. And then towards the end, oh, we'll have a summing up. So that's the basic structure of this episode. And I'm very excited to have Daniel and Damrato uh, on this topic. Okay, so first up, to begin with, Daniel Ingram, is there magic in the Dharma? Well, thank you for having this, because it's a topic that's dear to my heart. I um, I love the topic of magic, um, and it's one that I end up helping people a lot with. So I would first like to say I'm very thankful for Damarato for the podcast that he did with you earlier, um, because I think he raised a lot of excellent points, and points that curiously I would largely agree with. So um, the... I'm going to summarize sort of some of his riffing for him to say kudos to him, thank you. So we're we're building from a basis of something like common ground um, uh, in terms of basic things that magic can be a profound distraction for some, an obsession for others, a source of comparison or competition, um, confusing, potentially destabilizing uh, distracting from key points like the three characteristics or dependent origination or uh, just accepting this life here and now. Um, and all of those, I think, and more that he made are actually very, very valid points. So just starting off with those uh, and saying, yes, thank you, good. Um, uh, particularly points like rebirth in particularly in a lot of Southeast Asian countries, but certainly in the West as well, becoming something of a distraction or a perhaps derailment of Dharma practice or something of an excuse that, oh, maybe some next life when I have better karma or a better rebirth, I'll practice the Dharma, but this one I'll make merit, not that making merit isn't delightful and being generous and supporting the Sangha and all of that aren't delightful and important. But um, from a higher Dharma point of view, of course, we, you know, might say uh, that people might be practicing deep meditation to wake up in this lifetime. Uh, and so um, all of those are excellent points. And coming from that point of view, I totally get it. Also from a monastic point of view, where the training is very much um, don't demonstrate these things where the training is very much focused on deep wisdom and awakening. That's, you know, not only should monastics obviously be promoting um, morality or, you know, ethical behavior and uh, depths of concentration, but in particular awakening, you know, that's essentially sort of the sine qua non of Buddhism. Um, 
uh, and sort of the key point and focusing on that obviously has tremendous merit. So all those qualifiers and important thank yous to Don Murato out of the way, we get to some of the complexities and some of the complexities are one, from my point of view, who hand, you know who help um, uh, and volunteer to help a lot of people who are dealing with stuff that um, sometimes other meditation teachers may not have handled so well. For example, yesterday I had a two-hour conversation with someone who had some uh, what I will call power Z experiences on retreat. Uh, the teachers at the center where this person was practicing, which is a major Western Dharma center, uh, were disparaging, critical, um, alienating, unhelpful, um, appeared to be totally out of their depth, did not appear to have training or experience with these kinds of experiences, made the person feel bad about them, that they must have been doing the technique wrong, that there was some sort of incorrect practice, that they were somehow flawed or to blame by what seemed like well-described standard, normal garden variety uh, happens to people sometimes on retreat, even when doing non-magical practice stuff, happened to them. And so argument number one, from a sort of a, a help people on the path point of view, is that at least Dharma teachers who are going to be, say, you know, uh, teaching retreats on mass should have themselves, I think, at least a theoretical, if not hopefully an experiential um, uh, basis for helping people who have had these experiences, because these just sometimes arise, even in people who are doing techniques that are just about being here now or cultivating happy mind states or doing very, very simple Dharma practices. And sometimes they even arise seemingly spontaneously, though obviously dependent on conditions. Um, but through factors that are not immediately clear and obvious to people in daily life. And they can also be incredibly confusing, particularly if they're getting sort of the double whammy, as I will call it, of not only a medical culture and a psychiatric culture that is obviously in some ways permeating into society at some level that says these are purely pathological, would label them psychosis or delusion or something like that, even if they cause no obvious harm or disruption, it might have just sort of been interesting. Uh, and, and that with a, a culture of Western Dharma that was highly influenced by the colonial period. And while some would call, call that sort of a period of reform where the Dharma was sort of cleaned up of all of its strange animistic, you know, external beliefs, I think there's ample textual evidence that going very, very far back to the very beginnings of Buddhism, as far as we can tell, people will, were still having experiences that we might call powers related. And those sorts of experiences um, still happen today, as I can attest to um, myself from my own childhood before I was even a meditator that I knew of, and before I even thought of myself as a Dharma practitioner, as have members of my family, as have um, literally hundreds of friends and thousands of people I've talked to, and plenty of people I've been on retreat uh, with, and I've gotten to witness um, in small group meetings, occasionally back when I did retreats that had such things, what can go really wrong and make people feel very ashamed or alienated or even lose faith in their tradition and teachers when they have these experiences that to them might be confusing, but also might be beautiful or profound or even show them powerful things about causality and yet have their teachers relate to them in ways that are pathologizing, unhelpful, and just demonstrate a, a straightforward functional ignorance. And then I would say technical incompetence. Um, and so, and actually one of the most powerful lessons I ever got in cause and effect and morality and the fact that every single thought I had had consequences was one of my early experiences with the powers when I was intentionally attempting to cultivate them on a retreat in a monastery, a Sri Lankan monastery with Bhante Gunaratana, where those things were actually talked about and deep jhana was talked about as just a part of the path. Like it clearly uh, was. And uh, the one thing I will push back on quite hard is the notion that all this stuff just came in with Ashoka. Um, I think there's plenty of evidence that texts way older than that talk about 
um, the powers and even um, Biko Analio, with whom I have my own um, sparring contention, uh, I will grant him this one, his interest in teachings such as rebirth, at least in terms of, of experiences. These are experiences that can happen to people and I've had them myself. And while they can for some become a, a source of obsession or fascination or derailment or confusion, I actually found them quite beautiful, explanatory, straightforward, non-derailing, and simply actually enhanced my faith in the profundity and power of these techniques, as well as the deep understanding of karma and causality that was demonstrated by the people who had come before me, who had also explained these things, um, as well as some explanation of things in my own life that I actually found psychologically quite helpful. And so while well, I also know people who have had past life experiences that were very challenging, still to have teachers and Dharma teachers and thus and also friends in the Dharma, other people we walk the path with, who can have some mature relationship to these things that can see them in a balanced way um, and that can help people normalize, process, and then hopefully move on to deeper Dharma practice with them as just part of the fascinating causal display that occurred. Um, I think that those are all valid reasons that there has to be some portion of the population that is empowered to train in, in this aspect of very, very old, very, very interesting dharma and to, to help people, A, not be derailed by it, but B, also cultivate it if that is their path, because for some people, it simply is. I know people who every time they go on an insight retreat, even Thai forest stuff, even sometimes relatively low dose, they just have powers, the experiences. It's just their karma. It's how they were built. It's how they were born. Sorry, it doesn't fit, you know, the sort of paternalistic ideals that nobody should do this. And it's just a distraction. And like, everybody just stop, right? That's not realistic. Some people, that's just not going to work for. And we need at least some portion of the Dharma world that can still appreciate the much vaster range of experiences that is possible, not only through simple practices, but also through time-tested practices that it seems they were doing way back in the day that very straightforwardly lead to these in a reproducible way. Um, I'm not sure if that's my 15 minutes, but that felt like pretty much what I wanted to say. So I'll just stop there. That's actually nine minutes. So you can stop here or you can keep going if you have any further points. I, I think those are those are the big things I wanted to say, and I think discussion would be more interesting. So let's just uh, I'll just give up my six and and uh, let you respond, and then we'll see what happens. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, next up, Damarato. Uh, your time, <clears throat> fifty minutes. If you choose to use all of it, you can use less. Is there magic in the Dharma? Well, actually, I was prepared to answer a different question. And I think that uh, Daniel took it in that direction in, the, in anyway, in the sense of it's not a matter of is there magic in the Dhamma, but rather we're the, I thought the original question was, what is the value of magic in the Dhamma? And that uh, Dan has actually just addressed that quite well. Thank you. And um, more to that, I would also like to congratulate you, Dan, for the last interview that I heard from you. Um, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Dan, I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I don't think that I could take the onslaught of a mad monk. <laughs> the eight worldly winds blown personally as always and we just have to roll with that i would rather dodge <laughs> than roll with the punch <laughs> <laughs> and yet i understand that um uh there's already uh some feedback from the uh the talk that was just given about um the higher path that in fact you did mention that people do need to go through a lot of stuff before they're cleaned up finished with it and then they can go yippee this is it <laughs> and and never mind all of that stuff so uh the way that i would like to get started actually is by referencing a, a sutta 
uh, number 117 in the Majjhima Nikaya that is known as the Great Forty, but it's actually an exposition of the Eightfold Noble Path. Are you familiar with this sutta? It's not coming to mind at the moment, but please uh, give your exposition. All right. Well, I would like to actually um, ad hoc my way through the first part of it and then pick it up and actually read it out of the uh, translation that I have here. But very uh, basically, the Buddha starts off saying, uh, listen carefully, O monks, and I will tell you about um, right, noble unification of mind with its supports and attributes. Right unification of mind is that sama area samati. And sama area samati uh, is almost always confused with a concentrated mind rather than what we would refer to as a unified mind. And so then he says that among these, right view comes first. And that with right view, then he starts to talk and he says, is that first off, what is wrong view? And uh, here I start reading, what is wrong view? There is meaning, there is no meaning in giving, no meaning in sacrifice or offering. There is no fruit or the result of good or bad deeds. There is no afterlife. There are no duties to mother and father. No beings are re being reborn spontaneously. And there is no aesthetic or Brahman who is well attained and practiced and who ascribes the afterlife after realizing it with their own insight. This is wrong view. And let me take a moment and describe what that means. That means basically chaos. That if people believe that there is no result of actions, there is no past or there's no future, and they come down to the statement, I can get away with anything. And so keep that in mind, I can get away with anything. And then he says, what is right view? Right view, I say, is twofold. There is right view that is accompanied by defilements that is attributed to good deeds and ripens in attachment. And there is right view that is noble, undefiled, transcendent, and a factor of the path. And what is right view that is accompanied by defilements has a to, uh, attributes of good deeds and ripens an attachment. There is meaning in giving, meaning in sacrifice and offerings. There are fruits and results of good and bad deeds. There's comma for you. The law of comma, good actions and good deeds give good results. There is an afterlife. There are duties to mother and father. There are beings born spontaneously. And there are aesthetic and Brahmins who are well-trained and practiced and who describe the afterlife after realizing it with their own insight. Okay, so this is basic Buddhism that he's describing here. This is right view that is accompanied by defilements, has attributes of good deeds, and ripens in attachments. And what is right view that is noble, undefined, transcendent, a factor of the path? It is wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the awakening factor of investigation to investigate the principles a right view as a factor of the path and one whose mind is noble, undefined, uh, undefiled mind who possesses the noble path and develops the noble mind. This is called right view that is noble, undefiled, transcendent, and a factor of the path. And by the way, that word transcendent that they have here is actually the Lokatara be above the world, get out of the world. They make an effort to give up wrong view and embrace right view. That is one's right effort. 
is to give up wrong views. Mindfully, they give up wrong view and take up right view. That is their right mindfulness, right sati. So these three, three things keep running and circling around right view, namely right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. In that context, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? When you understand wrong thought as wrong thought and right thought as right thought, that is your right view. And what is wrong thought? Thoughts of sensuality, of malice, of cruelty. These are wrong thoughts. And what thoughts are right thoughts? There are twofold thoughts, I say. There is right thought that is accompanied by defilements that has attributes of good deeds and ripens and attachments. And there are right thoughts that are noble, undefiled, transcendent, and a factor of the path. And what is right thought that is accompanied by defilements has attributes of good deeds and ripens and attachment, thoughts of renunciation, goodwill, harmlessness. These are right thoughts that are accompanied by defilements. And what are right thoughts that are noble, undefiled, transcendent, and a factor of the path? It is the thinking, the placing of the mind, thoughts, applying, application, implanting the mind, the verbal processes in one mind as noble, undefiled, who possesses the noble path and develops that noble path. This is right thought that is noble. They make an effort to give up wrong thought and embrace right thought. That is their right effort. Mindfully, they give up wrong thought and take up right thought. That is their right mindfulness. So these three things keep running and circling around. Right thought, namely right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Now... It's a long sutra. I'm not going to go all the way through it, but I thought that I would read that. And I hope that it shows the, the power of the fact that there are three levels that we all live in. The animal level, the level of chaos, the level of wrong view, the level of dog-eat-dog, -dog, of taking advantage of criminality. And then there is the thought of the higher mind, which is more religious. It, it looks for heavens and hells and uh, uh, magic and all of that. And I will say that our civilizations are built upon that, that you cannot get a massive number of people to behave in a certain way unless you can get them all to believe the same thing. And so there are great uses for magic. You would go so far as to say that no one is ever going to move directly from wrong thought completely into right noble thought. That we have to move through the ordinary mind that is filled with magical ideas. It's an absolutely essential part of the path. One of the ways of looking at it is like uh, the uh, uh, SpaceX and uh, uh, Jupiter 5 and all of the rockets that have gone up are gone, done in stages to where they'll have huge, huge booster rockets to get that darn thing off the ground and get it flying up into the air and get it at a velocity that's useful. And then they jettison all of that baggage. And now they have one single blast rocket that takes it on out. So this is the kind of the way that we want to look at uh, the magical world is it's what 80% or so of the entire teaching is in the ordinary world. And that's all of the Buddhism that we know, including the precepts and the uh, triple gem and all of the rites, rules, rituals, bowing, scraping, and all of the stuff that goes along with Buddhism, or in fact, any of the trappings of any religion. And it, and it bonds people together. It gives them cohesion. 
And because of that, they can be useful as a society if that's what our intentions are. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, uh, it's not liberating completely. And so um, a really quick way of talking about that is, is that uh, in our deep ancestry, we were born and raised in the jungle. Everything was a jungle with pythons and alligators and reptiles all over. And we had to have fast reaction time. And we were very instinctual with the primary instinct of self-preservation. Eventually, we developed a, uh, the instinct of herding and then territorial instincts. So we, we picked up these instincts along the way. But in, in more, more modern times, we've been able to build civilizations. We built cities, marvelous things compared to the jungle. But wait a minute, don't they call it the concrete jungle? Maybe with all of our technology, we've never quite taken all of the jungle out of it. Or another way of thinking is, is the, yes, the human mind can be used in higher ways. But when we live in the instinctual world, we've got to find a way of come out of that instinctual world. But it comes out in stages. And so we have to come out of uh, first uh, the the raw instinct of fear and anger and anguish into the more subtle things like anxiety and stuff like that. But then there's the higher level, which is to be completely free of all of that stuff. Not worried about the future at all. So have I spent my 15 minutes yet? I've got about three left if you'd like them. No, no, I'm ready to walk right into it with Dan, because I think that we're on quite the same level anyhow. Well, great. Let's open it up then to discussion, please. Well, I would very much agree with a lot of your political critique, by the way. I'm definitely in some ways a political animal at that lower uh, level. Um, that relative Me? level. Political? Uh, no, uh, yeah, you, but, all, yeah, but also, but, um, but you're a central critique of the right and the left of the left promising things that probably will never be able to pay for and the right scaring people and making them basically insane. Um, I, th you know, variants of, of crazy from a certain point of view um, <laughs> and variants of delusion and magical thinking um, you know, we could agree, you know, agree or disagree on which one might be better or more skillful or whatever for a coherent society. Of but course, it's much more complicated than that because both sides plays both sides as a fence. <laughs> absolutely, yes. There, there's a lot of that, and so I, I, I would totally agree that um, religion can help uh, make for societal coherence, and it can also cause staggering amounts of conflict and death as the European experiment for about 500 years uh, showed. <laughs> um, hence the uh, attempt at the separation of church and state in the American experiment, which is also clearly failing to maintain that ideal. Um, and I, from a relative magical thinking level, I totally agree with you that it also can um, be uh, incredibly problematic that it, it could be, even though maybe higher than the notion of pure chaos, obviously not as high as one can go in terms of appreciating causality and things as they are. I would also definitely agree with you uh, the sort of booster stage approach. But beyond magical thinking and magical beliefs, I get back to the seemingly perennial question of people having magical experiences. Because right. plenty of these are not necessarily bidden. They, they didn't necessarily ask for them. In fact, the vast majority of people I talk with when they had these things, they weren't intentionally cultivating them. They weren't say doing something that I sometimes do, which is go on fire casino re retreats with my friends where we literally actively cultivate powers. That's you know um, some interesting portion of why we're doing it. Um, and we could talk about the, the pros and cons of that as well. Um, the vast majority of people I'm 
going on retreat with actually have some deep personal establishment in the Dharma and some reasonable portion are what I would call noble ones as you might as well. And that said, um, we still yet find some um, value in the actual uh, experiences of magic and the powers that can come out of very deep concentration. Not only can the, the interest in attaining the level of, of a very, very refined um, uh, mind that can do these things, not only does that seem to have its own skillful benefit, Right, the simple fact of stripping one's consciousness down so far and getting so far from the hindrances and getting a mind of such malleable and wieldly clarity that it can actually do these these rare athletic um, uh, powers things described in the old texts us following the breadcrumb trails of very very accomplished mendicants and monks and nuns. Oh, right. Yes. So and the question is. Are they going to get caught up in that or not? Yeah. Because that's just something new to get caught up in. Um, what's interesting is actually the curious thing is when we do this, the vast majority of people actually then find themselves somehow on the path of insight, even if that wasn't what they were actually looking for. So the curious thing, it's almost like a, the, the Dharma does something of a bait and switch sometimes, which is also not always mentioned in that when one gets one's mind that free of hindrances, that refined, that concentrated through tens or hundreds of hours of, you know, very, very deep, you know, putting aside the world, putting aside the digital devices, focusing on the moment and focusing on creating the sort of purified, wieldly, malleable, clear mind that can actually get to the level where one can you know, fill one's world with a color, for example, traditional practices that I think are traditional Buddhist as validly as any other. Um, uh, can, one can feel the elements moving. Mm -hmm. One could connect very profoundly with the experience of the water element or fire element or air element or earth element or space element or consciousness element. When one does this, that level of mind stripped of hindrances, made malleable and wieldy, not only can sometimes attain to the powers and sometimes attain to them actually reproducibly, you know, seemingly on command, though obviously from a higher Dharma point of view, simply causally, the universe unfolding impersonally as it always did, but the mind also can see impermanence, can see causality, can perceive suffering in incredibly subtle little levels and can perceive the subtle sensations that make up intention, that make up mental impressions, all of these things that construct the sense that there is truly a self somewhere in this heap of you know, causal transient aggregates. One can see that. And so it's just a very quick trip. Um, it's a very subtle tuning that you can take a mind that bright that clear, that powerful, and tune it to amazing Dharma practice. And what a lot of my friends who have gone on these retreats have noticed is um, uh, we, we actually uh, have a, a tagline for this, um, and it's come for the magic, stay for the suffering. Um, <laughs> what we mean by that is not that we're intentionally making ourselves unhappy or any unfortunate thing like that, but that you actually realize something about desire you actually realize something about the dissatisfaction that would cause a mind to want the powers. You actually realize something profound about the causality of all of that. You see clearly what it is that drives the whole game because the, the bright mind not only sees the objects of, of meditation clearly, but also sees the reactions to all of those objects. You can see the push, the pull, the tuning out, the ignorance, and that clear, bright mind um, and this is actually canonical, very straightforwardly in the fruits of the homeless life and in all the power sutras, where basically, you know, you get your mind super concentrated, super bright, super free of hindrances, very purified. You may do some powersy stuff, but then you turn to the three characteristics and you see with wisdom and you attain to realizations. And that has actually been very much the, the ex experiment and experience of uh, a lot of the people who go on these 
retreats. And so there, there is merit in that path, though clearly, yes, there's a potential for it to go very sideways and to derail. Uh, but we have a whole a group of people who collectively help keep each other on the path, that power of Sangha and that power of people who know the way, helping each other along the way. And, and so, um, yes, while it can be something of a dangerous experiment because it can get very, very strange, um, that said, life is a dangerous experiment, right? Um, we're in a precarious position. And so it's, uh, I would say that there has to be some validity for people who, for whatever karma reason, are called to play that dangerous game. Um, there has to be a place and a way that they can play it with people who know it and can help them along it. One of the things that was said in the sutta that a lot of people don't understand is that right view and right thought need to be seen with sati in this very moment and come out of those hindrances immediately. And then the next step within Anapanasati is to actually change those thoughts from unwholesome thoughts into wholesome thoughts immediately. And with that, uh, and the, uh, the working with the breath, one comes to the point of uh, sukha. So we start developing sukha and, and with that sukha, we can say that that sukha, which is actually the opposite of dukkha, is um, we feel safe and secure and confident and satisfied. And we keep practicing that with that right thought, sama sankapa, we start to change our attitude. And our attitude then becomes that we're successful also, that we can do this. We can come out of it. This is the practice of the Buddha that in fact, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa has been known to say that the Buddha only taught one kind of meditation. And that one kind of meditation was this quick way rather than the slow, hard way that you have been describing that has all kinds of pitfalls along the way with it and how much work and how much concentration that's always based upon desire within the context of Anapanasati is see that desire immediately, throw it out and say, hey, I'm good to go right now. I'm already all right. I don't have to go through any dark night of the soul in order to be okay. I'm already okay. And so this is kind of uh, uh, the easy way to do it. It's, it's also slow, but it's a slow, easy way as opposed to the slow, hard. And so um, I don't have anybody who's experienced with the, with the fast easy, but I've heard it exists, but most people- uh, I have a few friends who have been lucky enough to be fast easy. I know a few, they exist. <laughs> they exist in modern times. I, I know- uh, uh, one woman who's in her early 20s with no retreat time appears to be deeply established in profound wisdom and unusual Janak abilities as well. So they, they do exist, I think. Um, so in, in any case, that's basically what we're talking about here is that with Anapanasati and the trick is, is that you have to be able to start changing the thoughts immediately to come out of unwholesome thoughts immediately to stop having thoughts of desire or wanting things, greed, ill will, even greed for enlightenment. That's why the Zen masters will say, hey boy, you're already enlightened. Give up on wanting to be enlightened. You're already enlightened. Sit down and be, be easy. Yeah, well, I will, um, since we're into suttas here, somewhere in the 140 somethings of the Majimini Kaya, there's a series of four suttas, I'm sure you will know, called one uh, based on the, the same poem that repeats in all four, um, and one fortunate attachment. That if you're going to have one attachment, it should be to wisdom, because there is fuel in that, right? There is power in that, there is skillful motivation in that. And even if from a certain point of view, it is desire for wisdom and aversion to suffering 
still that is, I would say, the most skillful manifestation of desire and aversion than one could have, as clearly uh, did the Buddha said the same thing, it seems. Um, uh, the Funny, other thing I, I thought that that one fortune attachment away, and by the way, that's uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, uh, a fortunate night is another way because they talked about it like you you rent hotel rooms by the night, which is 24 hours. So in any case, um, the be here now part of it is, is that death may be coming. Who knows? The hordes are there, you know? And why moan about the past or, or carry on about the future? This present moment is all that we have. And we might as well uh, enjoy the heck out of it because here it is. Sure. Um, and then I will also say that while you say the way I'm describing is the slow and hard way, for some it is actually a fast and profound and relatively easy way because the mind that is that concentrated that powerful can be so free from the hindrances that wisdom may come quite easily. Uh, I know people who in, in 10 days on retreats like this have you know, um, become noble ones. And so that's relatively fast as these things go. Um, and um, also a mind that strong, if one has the karma or the capacity, which not everybody seems to, to, to have a mind um, become that concentrated even the old texts say only a small portion of people can do this right so this they even the old texts say this is clearly not the path for a lot of people right but for some portion for some well, I think when relatively... you advertise it the way you do then that means a whole lot of people listening to this says yeah I want that fast way I want it I want it I want it <laughs> right and you are absolutely right that is an extremely valid critique Right, and the comparison, the judgment, the disappointment, the the self criticism, the criticism of others, the the things that can go wrong, doing it without appropriate support, without friends who have some wisdom in this, who have um, you know know that path and how to navigate it. Um, you are absolutely right. I, I give you that one gold star. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a hundred percent true. Right, that is a and that's not and that's nice to have the counterbalancing point of view. But yet, I will say, on the other hand, a mind that concentrated can write profound changes on itself. A mind that clear can write profound changes on itself. Um, can the the actually the there there yeah, are examples ahead. of that all the time. There are uh, in real life. I mean, we can get, we can see that dukkha finally strong enough. An example of that is uh, burning yourself. If you burn yourself on that hot stove, you'll be really careful for a long time about that hot stove. That's true. Okay, so um, our, our seamstress that sticks her finger with a needle. She's going to be really careful for a long time about sticking her finger with a needle long after the sore is gone. Okay, that's the kind of profound impact that you're talking about, that yes, the mind can get into those states to where we profoundly impact it because there we can see dukkha. But the, the other way of doing it is with the sati. And the sati or the insight constantly, keep looking, keep looking, in breath, look, out breath, look. Look what's going on, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking, and keep changing those thoughts back into wholesome thoughts over and over and over again, and keep being in the here and now, and we practice to the point that we can get into that state, which is called first jhana, by the way, and just get into that and maintain it. And that's the path that the Buddha taught, is not to have the deep, don't need the deep states nor the profound insights that we can develop them one after the other, after the other, after the other by keep. So I guess the distinction would be the difference between the samadhi or the focus and having all of the components together as opposed to the concentration that's a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort that's put into it. 
Well, I would definitely agree and, and say that I, I'm not saying an either or, I'm saying an and. So yeah. definitely the, the path of, of the householder, the path of skillful deeds, the path of skillful reflection, the path <clears throat> of the, the, the relative reflection on I did this, I said this, I felt <clears throat> this, this happened, and that appreciation of suffering in the moment absolutely is, is a vital part of the path and, and a great way to go. And when I read the old text, I get that the, the Buddha taught an extremely wide variety of techniques depending on the capabilities, the karma, the conditioning, the, the, um, the limits, the, the ability to hear, understand, or uh, and practice certain methods. And so like, you know, from as simple as just like, you know, rubbing a rock or something very simple to just simple walking and noticing one is walking or simple breathing, beautiful, right? Beautiful techniques or just reflecting on dependent origination or simply saying, you know, I teach, you know, that which has a cause and poof, you know, some people that was enough for them to wake up. And other people, um, you know, such as Maha Moggallana, um, you know, for whatever reason, their karma seemed to be uh, that they would uh, follow the path of deep concentration and powers. And so I would say very much an and rather than an or. And while I can certainly profoundly appreciate the, the beautiful, the good news, as it were, the gospel that just by the simple thing of reflecting on your suffering, and what makes the mind happy and clear and skillful and what makes it suffer like that, that that simply alone can be enough to wake one up. That is good news and a, a beautiful thing to continually remind people of. That said, I would say and, right? That uh, I um, very much appreciate a lot of paths that people go by. And um, I'm sure you do as well. You get to see people going by all kinds of paths with all kinds of abilities, you know, challenges that can vary quite widely, interests and focuses. But to give something in the powers their due, like um, rebirth as a, which I know is one of your uh, favorite topics to sort of talk about, the experiences of those can actually um, at lend a profound sense of karma and causality, and that this leads to that. This deed led to this suffering. This deed led to this happiness for people who have those experiences. If they can see that, if it if exists. If they can see that, right. And so, but otherwise, they make up a magic story about it was a past life, which they do that kind of thing often in Thailand and right. in India. Sure. And then that can li live on two levels. Like I could say, you know, last Tuesday, I stayed inside because of coronavirus, as I did last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And in some ways, I'm right in that, from a relative point of view, that was what my life was. From another point of view, these are all impermanent thoughts arising and vanishing in this moment with no true past, no true future, and no true continuous self found in any of it, Simple, simply causes and conditions rolling on. But for some people that, you know, last Tuesday, I did this 10 years ago, I did this 20 years ago, I did this 100 years ago, I was reborn as this, that continuity is just a natural flow without anything weird about it. Right. And so that sort of sense of memory of relative uh, continuity, which obviously, from a high wisdom point of view is incredibly problematic and false and full of ignorance, from an ordinary point of view is just the way they describe their life. And so just as you might describe what you did say as a young man or on a motorcycle or in an accident, you describe that as if it was you. In some way, people also describe you know, uh, their, their past that it seems to extend um, beyond their point of birth uh, you know, in the same natural way without complexity. And there is a mature attitude that people can have towards these experiences that is simply that and nothing more and not a hindrance. Would this be a good time for me to interject some questions, do you think? Sure. One of the points that seems to be emerging here is that neither of you are disputing uh, the apparent, at least, functional existence of magic. Now, we haven't defined exactly what separates magic or powers from, uh, say, uh, any other action that one might uh, perform, like uh, being a good writer or 
of being a good communicator, for example. These sorts of, if you want, actions can be seen as quite mundane. And other things like knowing people's thoughts, hearing sounds from very far away, these are cer certain uh, uh, examples that one finds referred to in, in the sutras, uh, could be seen as more magic. We haven't really uh, defined uh, much of a difference there, but it seems neither of you is questioning that these things actually can and do happen, or at least one can have experiences that appear to be these things. Is that fair to say? Definitely not disputing that people can have these experiences, regardless of how one interprets them. I would say that trying to interpret experiences and clinging to experiences is um, one of the fetters to the path. Um, one example of that would be, um, let's say it this way, in India, in the ashrams, when a student of meditation is having these experiences and they say something, people gather around, the teacher wants to know all about it, they have a lot of questions, and in fact, there's some embellishment that starts to happen. In Thailand, if someone has these kinds of experiences and it comes to the teacher, the teacher will say, never mind, start again. Never mind, not important. They're not really important. It, it's just an experience and that you're trying to interpret it. That basically what you want to look at is how you're feeling rather than how you're trying to interpret those feelings. And so this is the way of looking at it, always in the present moment, and stop trying to make this experience or that experience an important point in time, but rather see everything as a flow, everything as a process. An example of that is little Tommy has been practicing the piano for his recital, and Aunt Susie comes over and Mommy says, please, Tommy, play the piece. And so Tommy plays the recital piece for his next recital perfectly. And everybody applauds. That was an event. He played it perfectly. But from the Dhamma point of view, oh, no, it was just uh, part of the uh, process that that performance could not have happened with all of the practice he had put in that this was a, not just a culmination, but just a point in time of the continuing of practice. But in fact, this little piece that he played now, he may forget about it while he's playing Chopin five years later. And so we have to begin to look at it as, as that each individual moment is no more valuable than the next right now. It's always this present moment rather than an eventful moment that we remember. Because whatever event that happens, that's going to pass. Everything keeps passing away. But that's an important quality of the Dhamma is the concept of a Nietzsche. Everything constantly moving. Everything's flowing. And so what we begin to do is begin to pick up on that. Rather, and so you could say that magical thinking is trying to stop that flow, actually trying to stop the cause effect, the cause effect that's rolling on and begin to pay more attention to it. Magical thinking, of course, and magical powers are, are a little, it seems a little bit different in the way you're, you're presenting that. It seems both of you are putting the powers, if we, would, if we just use that term, within the realm of possible experiences and treating it much the same way. In fact, that seems to be both of you are making that point in, for different reasons that, well, the magical powers can be seen as a part of one's possible experience. And uh, Murato, it seems you're saying, so you treat it just like you treat anything else. You'd apply the method. And uh, that's, that's uh, the strategy, so to say. That's how you relate to it. So I'm curious what both of you think of this. If we take the magical powers, so to say, and put them on the same level as, as other activities and thoughts that one might engage in, in the same basket. When you go to a new country, for instance, you might, even as a meditator, learn the language, or you might improve your writing style, for example, or you might uh, attempt to eat healthily. You might learn and acquire different skills, 
and different uh, capacities that you previously had not had because you need to speak Thai if you're in Thailand, for example, or you need to learn this new computer coding if you're going to be doing this computer coding job or something like that. You may also be a meditator. Is there any value in cultivating and acquiring the category of skills we might think of as the powers for a skillful use, say it could be in terms of service or in, in some other sense? It seems that that has been a traditional, in some areas, some cultures, some uh, views, then it's been a traditional way of seeing the powers is that they can be cultivated as something to enhance one's service and can be related to uh, independently, if you want, of your uh, inside practice. Would you, what do you think of that uh, particular idea? Is there, is there any room for cultivation of the powers or should they be just dismissed entirely? I would love to actually go back and in relation related to that question and address something. So I would say that with regard to the experiences of the powers as sort of distinguished from magical beliefs, religious, political, et cetera, um, I would say that clearly the immature relationship that someone, oh my God, they had a powers experience, like, oh my God, I had my first beer, you know, like, whoa, it was so crazy, you know, like that, you know, it's kind of like a bunch of teenagers like having their new first experiences, there could be a very immature relationship to that, the embellishment, the sense of fame or specialness and all, and all of that, which happens when these things you know, arise on rare occasions in immature practitioners and immature communities that do not have a mature relationship to the powers. I would agree that skillfully, one of the possible, I would say sort of semi-paternalistic or parental counters to that is then a teacher attempting to counterbalance that view in forces in their monastery or their practice environment or their sangha or whatever, the sense that these are not special, not to be given any undue attention. They are just more phenomena that come and go. Um, all thoughts of analysis should be put aside. There should be no mapping, no whatever. They're just it's just like grass growing or leaves falling, so what, right? And, and so that obviously is sort of a, a, a didactic enforced paradigm can be very skillful to sort of upgrade the level of maturity to what I would think of as the next level that is clearly better than the former. However, I, I know for myself and, and, and certain communities that there is there are other levels that I consider even superior to those that the powers may occur they have their problems and their benefits they can be related to in a straightforward way just like any other capabilities or human experiences if they require some interpretation there is a way to not only have the interpretation have some value but simultaneously to see the thoughts of interpretation as they actually are and permanent impersonal simply moving on and so the simple fact of um you know interpretation or analysis itself need not be demonized it's simply more phenomena rolling on and i would say that in and of itself is actually an even more mature relationship to the powers and to then answer uh your question guru viking steve um then that more mature relationship has the space within it to encompass views such as some people may have these, they can be used skillfully or unskillfully like any other technology, like the internet, like the ability to publish or the ability to do whatever. You could use that skillfully or unskillfully you know, to create benefit or to harm people. And it's just one more thing like money, like, you know, like anything. Um, it's a, it may be a resource and there's a way to just have it be incorporated into one's ordinary morality and ethics not in a way that is neither special nor ignored or repressed nor shouldn't be analyzed if one has analytic capability. Actually, I keep going back to the point that these powers, if you will, are very, very rare. And that people, there are two ways of developing these powers. So I would understand. One is the Satya Sai Baba way. Are you familiar with him? Because he was the very biggest and best 
of the superpowers in India until he died just recently. I seem to remember some controversy around him, to put it gently. Yes. Actually, the controversy was is he literally got caught in many, many ways. Uh, the first place that I got introduced to him was actually back in the 1970s. I was on a train going to Bangalore to go see him. And an Indian woman who spoke English on the train, you know, they're very friendly. And we had a conversation. She invited me to her house with the express intention to show me this expose that had just not long ago, maybe a year or so before, been, been published in the Bangalore, Bangalore big newspaper. Big expose, page after page of photos of showing his sleight of hand. Didn't put even the slightest dent in the, follow, in the followers. Now I see on YouTube that uh, he's been thoroughly debunked as a, um, uh, a sexual charlatan. Uh, as well, just like Rajneesh was was shown to be a, a charlatan. And yet they still have many, many thousands of followers, just like, in fact, right now we have that same thing with Donald Trump, with the same mentality. Yes. Okay. That's the dangerous part in the sense that those people... Uh, are afraid to see that their job to do to get their mind straightened out has to be done right now. That they can't wait for the next life or until the guru comes by and performs a magic trick or until I believe in this, that, or the other thing. It's always future-oriented, future and past. That's the problem with ordinary right view is, is that it takes people into the future and into the past, and that's why it ripens in clinging. It is only after we give up all of that stuff, wanting it, um, two stories come to mind. One is, is that the, uh, the young Zen monk comes to the old master and says, Master, Master, do you meditate to become enlightened? The old master opened one eye and says, No. I meditate because I am enlightened. And then the other story is, is that the, uh, uh, the big samurai comes storming into the temple and all of the monks bow and scrape except the abbot. The old general walks up to the abbot and he draws the sword and he says, don't you know I can cut you in half without blinking an eye? And the old abbot says, sir, don't you know that I can stand here and be cut in half without blinking an eye? Now, what we're getting at at these stories is, is that if we keep coming back to the right now, to the here now, this moment is always good enough. And so stories about the future, whether it's far future or whether it's the future in this life is still irrelevant. Wanting something is actually a state of suffering. And yet we think that if we want it, if we get it, then we'll feel whole. But right now, without it, I'm not whole yet. But if we practice wholesome thoughts, part of wholesomeness is just to feel like that we're whole. So we begin to nourish ourselves and allow this moment is okay as it is. I don't need any magical powers. I don't have to believe them anyway, but now what happens is that I don't have to have any doubts. You see, what we're left with, with all of these magical powers is one of the clinging ways that we write in is in the sense of doubt. Is it true or not? Guys, believe me, I spent about 10 years all over Asia trying to prove to myself magic was existing or not. I mean, I've been to Sachi Sai Bar. I've been to the big guys. And I kept getting disappointed because I kept looking for the wrong stuff. 
And I think that that's what the dark night of the soul is all about. And it wasn't until I got to Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa when I came to understand that it's this present moment and we have to have good, wholesome thoughts in this present moment and wanting things that we don't have, whether it's real or magical. It can be a flying saucer or it can be a automobile or it can be a bicycle. If I don't have it and I want it, that same desire is going to be there. And instead of developing the powers, wanting all of those powers, striving for all of those powers, the better thing to do is to be happy without them. I don't need that stuff. I'm okay. I'm already okay. Everything's all right. Everything's fine. Everything's going to be okay. And I've got the skills to handle whatever happens. That's when that right attitude kicks in that no matter what happens, I'll take care of it. I'll handle it with grace and dignity and silence, and I'll be okay. Even if it's my own death, whatever comes, I can take care of it. It's good. Friends with everything. You see, the, one of the issues about magical powers is what do you want to do with them? You want to impress other people? You want to conquer other people? You want to use them to harm people? What's the point of having magical powers anyway? I actually had a dream uh, that was a hyper lucid dream. It was incredibly vivid, almost at the level of a full out of body travel. And in the dream, there was a competition where there were these three gems, a blue one, um, a red one and a yellow one that were big, beautiful, um, seemed extremely precious gems of the primary colors and they were flying around in this sort of uh, space. And I was flying around and I managed to grab all three gems. And in the dream, when one had all three gems, the, the triple gem, one had the power. And I was the one who managed to grab all three gems, almost like the seeker in Harry Potter, but I had this dream many years before Harry Potter came out. <laughs> And as I then touched back down, landed back on the ground off, off the side of the game court, there was an old man uh, wrapped in something like a, a gray toga, looked very much like a monk, shaven head. Um, and this old shaven head man in the toga said to me, okay, you have the power. Now, what are you going to do with it? I was about to ask you that. Did you have the power yeah. to let go of those triple gems? So, and then, so that's, and then that was actually one of the most profound magical questions that ever happened in my whole life. Um, what's interesting actually is when I go on retreat these days, um, it's often to do the deep concentration stuff you consider the long hard way and I consider the truly delightful feels like I'm coming home way. So people can react differently to that sort of a path for some way, for some people it's alien, it's tough, it's not them, it's not their cup of tea. I totally acknowledge and respect that. For others of us, it feels like coming home. It feels like this is what we were meant to do. It feels like this is what we were built for. It feels like this is being in our element, so to speak. And and so this is- Yes, but and generally so, when people get to that point, they're ready to quit their job and come stay in Asia and that kind of stuff. I mean, well, I've been yes. done that. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. Okay. And, but we've got a whole audience of people who are not ready to do that yet. They need uh, the gift of the Dhamma right now and coming out of their magical thinking and getting it done in this moment so where they can bring joy and satisfaction and safety and security into their life right now, mm -hmm. that's what they need. And so you desire a magical future in which that is the best medicine for everyone in the audience and that that Dharma teaching will reach them, touch their hearts, be properly heard, be properly incorporated into their practice Sometimes. and liberate them. And Sometimes. I magically <laughs> desire a future in which those few people for whom this is the path that calls to them are also uh, normalized, acknowledged. It's also considered valid where these experiences can be talked about 
at, like we would discuss anything else, like they seem to be discussed in the old texts, where people just said, ah, he can do this, ah, she can do that. Oh, cool. Like it was just like, oh yeah, you know, Monte, you know, and da Medina can do Naroda Samapati, you know, so and so can do this. You know, there it was just like, oh yeah, so like it was just like, and by the way, this person's really good in morality, and this person can remember the sutras really well, and this person, you know, it's just like any other thing. And it it didn't have this this weird You've thing never around been it. And in I, any conversation like that. I've been well, in the actually, wrong crowd. <laughs> I have. So the, but the thing is, the other thing is when you set yourself up a certain way, certain people gravitate towards you. And so my friend circle, that's just ordinary stuff. Like, you know, uh, that's just the world I swirl in. And that all of these worlds could acknowledge that the other is valid, that the other has merit, that the other is, this is the magical future that I desire. And so we both de desire <laughs> magical futures, in which case everything sort of aligns with what our own path has been, because each of us have come from our own path and yours was one of seeking and suffering and then finding the path that you found. This is your conditioning, as you explain quite clearly, that was beautiful, profound, liberating, healing, marvelous, wonderful, sadhu, the good stuff, right? And I have utmost respect for that. Right, I feel that. I feel that love and that wisdom and that experience that is born of your own suffering and your own freedom from that suffering coming through from that. And in the same way, I come from my conditioning. My conditioning is the powers were happening to me before I even had, knew what the Dharma was, right? And I actually pushed them aside for a long time when I, I, I ran into people actually who said pure insight practice just notice things come and go. And I did that for a while and I did, and it was very helpful and it gained me fruits and benefits of the path. It gained, it gained me a foothold in the Dharma, the Dhamma. But then that no longer was able, that, that wall that pushed away some of those tendencies no longer was viable. It just wasn't gonna be possible anymore. And I recognized that my karma my path unfolding was going to have to deal with this strange world of these strange experiences. And that happens to some people too. And so both of us teach from our conditioning, from what we've come from. And I think the ecosystem of the Dharma needs to realize that it's big enough to allow for both. And the vast majority of people, I will grant you, are going to benefit from your wisdom, not mine. From your point of view, not mine. From your conditioning, not mine in terms of just sheer scope and scale and the vast majority are your, what you are saying will be more skillful, will be more effective, will create more, more noble ones, will create less distraction, less, less chaos, less trouble. But I would also push back a little bit and say, there has to be some room in the ecosystem for teachers and practitioners whose path and karma is different from that. And so to have to begin to raise the level of maturity of the conversation and say, yes, there are these people who, for whatever strange reason, not good, not bad, just different, just reality unfolding as it does, that's what they're dealing with. And there must be skill, skillful mentors, peers, guides, technology, et cetera, for those for that who is their karma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me. Let me add something to that in the sense of um, don't want to go too much into the history of Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa and what happened with him in the 1930s. But basically the outcome of that was is that he found that, that there were many nobles in Thailand and that one of them was uh, the Samdat Sangharaj, the, uh, the actual kind of prime minister or the top monk in Thailand, took Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa on as a student. After Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was a monk for 10 years, making a whole lot of noise in Bangkok that got him into a lot of trouble with the noble Dhamma. And so he got into the, to the club that way. But one of the things that he always did from that time was is that he said that he wanted to speak openly that within the Thai Sangha for many many centuries and generations there's always been the teaching of the Dhamma on two levels 
the two levels would be the ordinary, the mundane level, and then the super mundane level or the noble level. And that most people live at the ordinary level. And so we teach them Buddhism at the ordinary level. That ordinary level then is the level that um, it can be expressed in many ways. And I've seen a lot of monks do this quite skillfully so that they can talk to one individual at one level and another individual at another level. That really skilled monks, in fact, can do it in one talk in the sense that they will talk at a, at a um, mundane level for the first hour or so until the ordinary people get really tired out. And then he'll start speaking at, an order, at a super mundane level and the people who are ready for the super mundane will then pick up their ears and listen to what he has to say while the ordinary people uh, are uh, not quite sharp enough to recognize that he's actually contradicting many of their beliefs. And so uh, there is this movement from the ordinary level where you could say the ordinary level is that we would teach the precepts as if they were comma. If you do this good action, you will get good result. And if you do that action, you will get bad result. And so this is the way that we teach the children. But uh, with Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa uh, having such influence on Thailand, mostly in the aristocracy, in fact, uh, the profession of judges and the legal profession in Thailand is almost the whole profession is devoted to Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa because of a series of talks he gave way so many years ago uh, to the judiciary. And so it's that kind of quality of people, the ordinary Thai people who are the farmers and whatnot are left in their old belief systems to where the noble belief or the noble Dhamma is taught then uh, and widespread in Thailand. So uh, Achan Po then has told me to make sure that when I'm teaching to only teach at that noble level that already there, there is plenty of Buddhism in the West. It's already at the ordinary level. And I got to say that, uh, Dan, you're one of the kings of that level of the Dhamma. And that um, that's quite excellent. Uh, but we do need to have the higher Dhamma come to the West to come in the sense of uh, the, the very highest noble views of things to where we automatically just remember to transcend the world over and over and over again that we don't have to work our way through insight after insight until we finally let go no we just keep letting go and keep letting go and keep letting go until it be built, built it up as a habit and so this is the uh the path that is anapanasati and it all has to do with that quality of recognizing what the mind is doing it and then changing it. It's not a matter of noting it and then noting it and then noting it and then noting it, but rather note it and then kick it out. Note it and put something wholesome in its place. Keep putting the wholesome in. Keep putting the nurturing thoughts in. This is the practice that is always the more super mundane, not hoping for something better in the future, but having the very best there is right now and keep practicing that way. So this is the practice and that it, um, actually I would go so far as to say that you were practicing wrongly just like I was for a long time and then something clicked inside. It may have been the dark night of the soul when you came out of that thing you say darn it i can handle that i can handle anything and off you go and that's the whole point is a change of attitude can you do this if you've got it in your if you've got the um the spirit of success for the dhamma knowing that you can have a noble mind that you can crawl out of your own junk that you can uh keep practicing that no matter how obstructed the mind gets we can come back we can clean out the mind. We can come back to this very moment and get a big kick out of process. Of it. That all happens in one, two, three, four, five mind moments. About a half a second.
Well, I would agree that form of practice is excellent and that emph emphasis is excellent. And uh, the, the little jab at noting there, I'll just kind of roll with, I'm used to that. It's a Thai Burmese <laughs> thing that is karma rolling <laughs> onward, right? It's conditioning. We both come from conditioning in our experiences, some of which really appreciate that technique and some of which super don't, right? And that's okay, right? Because there's uh, the Dharma is large and um, has a lot of uh, various medicines for various ailments and various options for various types of practitioners. I can really appreciate why you prefer that emphasis. And I think there are definitely lots of people for which that emphasis is entirely appropriate and excellent. Um, and it's also worth noting that even on Mahasi retreats, we've done you know, loving kindness practices usually every night at the end of the, the sit, um, there is emphasis on skillful states of mind. There is emphasis on suppression of the hindrances. There is tremendous emphasis on impermanence and just sensations coming and going, which we would all agree on. There's tremendous emphasis on using the thinking mind in ways that are skillful rather than unskillful. And so, and even the noting technique itself of this comes and goes, this comes and goes, and just recognizing those things is in many ways doing exactly what you say. It's substituting a thought of recognition, a thought of clarity, a thought of, I saw that, a thought of that is what was going on in this moment. This is the experience and turning the thinking mind from full of hindrances or an enemy to a friend to an aid, to a support. Now, what a lot of people sort of miss in the Mahasi technique is that as soon as the mind gets faster than notes can go, which is actually quite fast if you're talking about five mind moments in half a second, that's 10 sensations per second. You can't note 10 sa sensations per second. So at that point, it becomes something of a beginner technique, a support mm -hmm. to get to the level of clarity when one can notice. And what most people fail to recognize in even books like Practical Insight Meditation is that he shifts from noting to noticing. And unfortunately, the word is so close that most people do, do not get what Excellent they Excellent for said. bringing this up. Thank you and, for and bringing so, this up. Because what Mahasi actually taught was as soon as the noting is too slow and slowing you down in a hindrance, rather than suppressing the hindrances, which was what it was designed to do, it itself can become too cumbersome. And then to bring simple the clarity of noticing, again, the similar words, that, uh, um, that it's actually just about the direct experience of phenomena coming and going. And so, and to be able to do that moment to moment is to have suppressed the hindrances. To begin to do that moment to moment is to gain freedom in that moment from the sense that any of this is permanent, a self, a stable entity for, with a true past and a true future. And so these techniques, I think, are actually much closer than it's often represented as if like, oh, noting's this and Thai forest is that or whatever. Like it's really not. And functionally, it's, it's essentially the same it's, Dharma, the same emphasis, just with some initial starters that are kind of different and a little, and, and when I think about the, the, the sutta, the, the removal of distracting thoughts, where you know, a, 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 you know, an unskillful thought comes, and you just think a more skillful one, or an unskillful thought comes, and you just recognize its impermanence, or an unskillful thought comes, and you reflect on why it was unskillful to think it, you know, or an unskillful thought comes and you substitute some like jhanic quality of piti or sukha or bliss or joy, or an unskillful thought comes and you crush mind with mind and say, no, I will not think that unskillful thought, right? I will not uh, do that unskillful thing with my mind. Then it's that really these are all things in the basket of standard Buddhist how to handle hindrances and unskillful states of mind. And the, the traditions really are just sort of sort of a little bit emphasizing one versus the other, but really all of them I think are an important part of the mix such that we can do exactly what you were saying we all should do very skillfully. While you were speaking, one of the uh, images that came to mind was like a team of horses that are well chosen so that they have the same coloration, the same height, and that they're a team, okay? 
And that's how I see you and I working together just at this level is to recognize that we're a team going off in the same direction and that there is individuality only to a degree that mostly it's the same teaching. Right. And it has the same valuable result that is yes. so rare to find. Unfortunately, but it takes but yes. one to know one. <laughs> <laughs> and so good to know you, friend. Good to know you as well, sir. <laughs> Actually, speaking of the powers and back to the powers, that topic of knowing noble ones. So th the last, if I remember the sutta, correct me, and your sutta knowledge may be better than mine. I believe the last question that the Buddha was asked because he, with his powers, could see people's wisdom just intrinsically. He had that as a psychic power, could see a clear mind as a clear mind, an unclear mind as an unclear mind, a noble mind as a noble mind, an ignoble mind as an ignoble mind. And Precisely. And someone went to the Any Buddha. good psychologist can do that too if they're worth <laughs> their salt. <laughs> it's a skill to be developed. It's not magic. It's paying yeah. attention. Sure. It's looking at the congruities, the incongruities, and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, th so your point is actually very important because the Sangha back in the day had clearly come to rely on the Buddha to do this mm -hmm. because the Buddha was around. The Buddha could do this, it says. And, and so there, when the Buddha was dying, they were like, oh my golly, the, the validator of wisdom, right? The person who can just see it like they see anything else, like you see color, um, the, the, the Buddha was dying. And someone said, how will we recognize the noble ones? How will we recognize who has the, the true Dharma? And I actually am only slightly disappointed in his answer but if I remember correctly, it was basically look to the Sangha, but be lights unto yourselves that your own wisdom, regardless of anyone else's, is the thing you should rely on. And so curiously enough, this actually is an argument against the powers, right? Because they had come to be slightly disempowered because the Buddha had this power, right? And so they had come to not entirely trust themselves because they trusted the Buddha to do this for them. And so curiously enough, when the Buddha died and they no longer had the guru with the power around, then they had to actually be lights on, unto themselves. They had to rely on their own wisdom and their own skill and their own insight. And it actually, so curiously enough, the death of the Buddha actually helps make your argument um, that uh, because these things can be subtly disempowering in some way, and how will we know who has wisdom? Uh, so there's lots of different ways to read that story, but that's definitely one, because I do see as a downside of the powers, lots of teachers that can be impressive. I mean, I know people who have been to teachers that they can just touch them and cause energy to go blasting through their bodies and stuff. This stuff happens. And in fact, I've had some experiences similar to that with some healers who had unusual gifts of healing, by the way, one of the skillful uses of the powers, if people can relate to it skillfully, because I've known some unusually gifted healers who have helped me, um, mm. actually. The and police I can do that. They call it tasers. Well, um, and it, sometimes you can have static electricity. There, quite some of these people are quite a shock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. Okay, but but the point is that but but all of that said, these gurus who do have and display these powers can definitely be not only a distraction, but also a disempowerment to their own students, who then, in the face of that, may become subtly infantilized, or become like children, or become dependent, or not they trust want their something own something they don't have. Right. And, and so in that, I very much agree with you that there is danger and there is unskillfulness and there is the potential for people not to, to, to come into their own wisdom and rely on themselves and be lights unto themselves. So I will definitely say that is a, a challenging aspect of anything to do with discussing the powers. Um, I would then counter, though, and say, 
because meditation technologies and psychedelics and hot yoga and other powerful practices that I mean, seriously, like, and I've known some people in, you know, super intense hot yoga classes to get into some wild energetic things and strange heart openings and seeing visions and stuff. It can happen, right? And other settings, th these things are scaling so fast. And we have a healthcare industry that has no options other than to call these things pathological and psychosis and to give them powerful antipsychotic drugs, which hopefully- well, How else are they going to make money off of it? Well, okay. And so, so it, then you're recognizing, as I do, that having that setting where suddenly this is scaling rapidly, I would say there's an argument to be made that it is unethical not to be discussing that these experiences can arise sometimes and to have at least some class of recognized people that have training and experience and direct knowledge and wisdom of this for themselves that can demonstrate something of a mature relationship to these and model the, that mature relationship for those people who their karmic path is going to be to have these experiences rather than a healthcare system that simply has none of that optionality except in, in the transpersonal you know, um, liter, you know, realm of transpersonal psychology, which has never managed to really penetrate the mainstream. And so uh, these are arguments both for and against discussions of the powers. And I can see it both ways. Well, there's a, there's a whole nother way of uh, looking at, at the dangers. Going back to the point of view or the points about wrong view, ordinary right view, and super mundane right view. The point that you're talking about here is all of these people that are having all of these experiences is because they're in that uh, ordinary right view that has the magic and the powers and all of that in it, as opposed to, and I suppose those people that are having these magical experiences are a whole lot better off than the mobsters that are out killing each other in wrong view. And so ordinary... <laughs> Although I do know some dark witches and wizards, right? And so there are people who are also having these experiences and have some of those capabilities who are not the nicest of people. Mm -hmm. So- And their views uh, could be upgraded perhaps. All right, so um, getting that as a foundation and it looks like that the basic method for people to go through is from the wrong view into ordinary right view. And the best time to move people from the one to the other is when they're children. We kind of threaten or talk them into it. As an adult, it's really hard to get, for instance, an atheist to join a church. <laughs> we can get little kids to do it, right? So um, as that is an example, Moving then the mind from the ordinary right view into the super mundane right view is downright dangerous. So you're talking about the dangers and the, the, the parts of it within ordinary right view that does ripen into all of this clinging that you're talking about. Yes. Okay. And that the uh, profession is not... Um, prepared for that True. but then there is the other side and that is is that if someone is uh too early introduced to the super mundane and they're told that well by the way there is really no common you can go do anything that you want to do then they'll immediately kind of with that attitude go back into the wrong view and then start saying well what the hell and then they go back in pick up all of their old bad habits or whatever like that, and they don't do themselves any favors much at all. That's one of the dangers is, is that people don't take what we call the, uh, you've heard no, no doubt about Sutta number 22, the simile of the snake. Mm -hmm. Grabbing the snake by the head, you've got to grab it, not just by the neck, because snakes, if you grab them by the neck, they'll turn around and bite you immediately. No, you've got to grab him right by the throat, right by the, with your thumb on his head, you've got to hold that snake tight. That's the whole point about the Dhamma, that we have to grab the Dhamma correctly, or it will turn around and bite us, just like the Dhamma is biting all of these people with all of these um, experiences 
But the guy who grabs the snake at the wrong end in the sense that he's moving from the mundane into the super mundane, he can get bit into wrong view. And it's quite easy to happen. Uh, I think that one of the, um, what you would call the safety nets would be Meta and Karuna Mudita because we could go off and in Upeka. the direction. Huh? And Upeka, equanimity. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm sure that we, if we spent long enough, we could cover the whole Dhamma. <laughs> 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 right here. Talking about how long are we going to let this last? Hey, what about three days <laughs> instead of three hours? <laughs> But the so, problem anyway, let me talk about the second point. And the second point is, is that there is another issue that makes the super mundane very dangerous. And that is that when people will hear of the super mundane, see the super mundane, uh, understand the nobles the way that they do, and yet they are still tightly clinging to the mundane then they will become enemies of the super mundane rather than having that as a natural sequence to move to, it will, they will become enemies. And a lot of Buddhists have died at the hands of those who were clinging very strongly to one religion or another. That Buddhism is in fact not, you, if you think of it like this, if atheism is the enemy of Christianity, then Buddhism is just flat out its destroyer. Because atheism argues with Christianity to where if you have no self, then what does God matter? After I die, I don't care what God does. We can, you know, be friends or whatever like that. We, but I don't care about what happens after I die. Let me be good now. An idea then we could look at is in the sense of we don't really know what the future is going to bring. We do not know what the distant future, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Never mind 300 years or 10,000 years from now. We don't know. We just don't have a clue about the future. So the right way to do it then is develop the skills so that we can handle anything. Be ready for anything. And then we're become secure. I'm secure in the knowledge that it doesn't matter what happens to me before, during, and after I die. I can handle it well. Thank you very much. Well, to give my cont contemplative uh, Christian and Islamic and uh, Jewish, et cetera, um, uh, fellow wanderers on the path their due, um, <laughs> those traditions also do teach a tremendous amount of of patience, of kindness, of wisdom, uh, an appreciation of suffering, the main an teaching. aspiration to nobility, um, and to to orient the heart and mind towards the good and away from the bad, towards wisdom and understanding and away from confusion. And and so uh, you know, as but I look, those are I, only ideals as teachings. Like, for instance, the teachings of Jesus, but what you see in Christianity in the action is Trumpism. Well, I also see, you know, um, monks blessing the troops to go kill the Rohingya in Burma. And so, uh, so this is, this is not a unique phenomena to the Abrahamic religions by any means, unfortunately. By any means. And so... So I would say that all of those religions can have their benefits and also have their risks of alienating, of creating self and other, those who deserve compassion and those who don't, those who deserve to be treated well and those who, who don't. So that sort of us and them mentality um, with regard to Christianity or Buddhism or atheists or any of them, one, one must uh, be very careful with that sort of thing. Um, and so, so that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is I would say it is too late. So it, perhaps there was a time when the cat was not out of the bag, when magical teachings or dangerous super mundane teachings or powerful tantric teachings or you know esoteric teachings or the, the teachings that were routinely kept to back rooms and closets and only for the students or practitioners or devotees that had become somehow ready for that. Um, we are long past that now. That was decades ago 
when that was still a viable option. And now with the internet, everybody has access to essentially everything. The most esoteric, bizarre, weird, complicated, dangerous, unbelievably easily misinterpreted teachings are out there in such unbelievable abundance that the notion that we that it's too late. And so given that it is too late, there is the attempt to either say, no, 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 none of that, the pure path. And to put the cat back in the bag by sort of pushing all of that away, certainly for some that will work and be skillful and noble and helpful and clarifying and cleansing and achieve all of the good things that you hope it will achieve. However, it will, I don't think, be necessarily an effective strategy for everyone. And so I didn't there, know I, think... I was hoping about anything. I was just <laughs> kind of enjoying the moment. Well, fair. But, but in the but same in kind case, of way. Let's look at it. Yes, I, be, I believe that the time is too late in the sense of with the internet and with other for, features of uh, modern society that is almost like a brand new, new explosion. Yes, but things are in turmoil. The the uh, uh, the blast is still in the happening. Mm -hmm. But what will happen is the blast will run out. The debris will be in the air, and the dust will settle. And, and when the dust dust settles, what's the world you envision then, with regard to the Dharma and the teachings and what people have access to and magic? I'm what do you not envision? interested in that. I'm interested in watching the explosion we're having right now. Who cares what happens later? <laughs> I'll take care of that when it happens. I'll enjoy that one too. All right. It's about just enjoy the show. I don't need my money back. I don't have to complain about it or be critical. I can just sit here and just have a ball. This is so entertaining. <laughs> well, that's a great attitude. And I very much appreciate that sort of attitude. Obviously, that has delight. But um, then I would also bring up a concept I've bring up, brought up on a lot of podcasts before, which is mage and sage, right? I don't know if you've heard me talk about this one, sage and mage or mage and sage. So okay. Sage says, the world is a mess of crazy politicians and absurd kings and laws and greed and corporations and madness. There is a pure way that puts all that behind one, the path of the renunciate, the path of saying the past is gone, the future has not arisen, this moment is too transient to withstand scrutiny. And I will wonder. And is turning your back on it. Right, I will wander lonely like a rhinoceros. I will, I will renounce the world. And of course, as a renunciate, that's your job to hold that view, to demonstrate the validity of that path, of that noble path, of that way, that attitude, that dharma that can turn away from all this and say, no, just skillful means, just this moment, just the path of the renunciate, so simple, so clean, so elegant, so excellent, so noble, so beautiful, right? And there's that. And then there's the path. And there's another point about that that you made. And that is, is that, and the Western Buddhist and the Western people need to know that that kind of experience of being alive is available. Yes. That it's not just magical thinking. Right, absolutely. And to, to, to hold that up as an ideal and to model that and to show the validity and beauty of that is so necessary in this screwed up world, right? But that said, there is also the path of the mage. And the mage says, we have the power, the training, the wisdom, the knowledge. Society is suffering. There is greed, hatred, and delusion, right? there is corruption, there is unwholesomeness, there is unbelievable pain. And the, the medicine of the Dharma, of the spiritual teachings of, of this path can be spread into the world. You know, you know, do not even two of you go together, wander off and, and, and help this ailing world. And interestingly enough, the, the Buddha himself, as have most of my friends on the path, 
oscillated clearly between mage and sage. Sometimes he thought the world is a mess as he did it right after his realization. There's no point. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the fruits of my path. Enjoy this moment. The past is gone. The future has not arisen. Just be here now with the beauty of the Dharma realization. And then there, there were times when he would wander for say 45 years across the length of breadth of Nepal and the area of India and wherever else he was wandering around as did countless uh, nuns and monks as well, spreading the Dharma, spreading the teachings, encouraging the world to heal, to be better, to suffer less, something of the Bodhisattva path in some way, although already a Buddha, but that kind of ideal to help other people in this. And so I think recognizing that oscillation, even in you, to talk of kings and politics and all of that, to even mention that is to be a little bit mage, to, to Skype out into the world, to project the Dharma, you know, digitally, through podcasts, through media, to a world that needs help, that needs aid, that needs, that where the future is our concern, because this moment is transient, but we care about what people have going forward. This whole conversation is about what sort of world do we want to live in? How will the Dharma be in it? Will it be healthy? Will it be skillful? Will it awaken people? Will it lead to good results rather than bad ones? Will it not become a mishandled snake, right? And so we obviously, at the same moment as appreciating this moment, can also appreciate that the wish for a better future is arising as part of this natural causal wise transience. And so to be able to have both simultaneously and an integrated made sage flow where they get along and appreciate each other rather than are in conflict, rather than it's not one or the other, but some skillful wisdom that incorporates both. I think that clearly by our actions and our words is both of our dream. Gosh, and all of that. And I just thought I was having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I will back up a little bit and talk about Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa and nice. that he had the concept and the idea of duty to the Dhamma, that in fact, Dukkha is when we're not doing our duty to the Dhamma. So any negative thoughts is not doing our duty, that our duty is actually the duty to the Dhamma of having wholesome thoughts having wholesome thoughts, wholesome ideas, wholesome friendships, and spreading the Dhamma in that wholesome way. That our metta and our karuna is to spread the Dhamma. And another way of talking about it is, is that it's all about generosity, giving gifts, and that the Dhamma is the very, very best gift to give. And so I'm actually duty-bound not just by Achan Po's marching orders, but Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa way in the back is saying, this is your duty. That there is duty to the Dhamma and the duty to the Dhamma is to make friends in the Dhamma and to spread the Sangha, allow the Sangha to grow without hope for anything. I don't hope for anything. I don't count how many views or whatever like that. It, yeah, better not. <laughs> I might like it. <laughs> <laughs> and so just having fun yeah, in this I present agree. moment and spreading that joy, spreading the fire to the students, um, uh, giving them that spark of the Dhamma because that's what they need that they can't get from a book. A book does not have fire in it to set the student on fire. Sometimes we will have inspirational books, but they don't last long. That it takes a relationship. That if I had not been able to develop a relationship with Achan Po and Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, I wouldn't have a clue about how to talk to people or do the Dhamma at all that it really has to do with that warm, tender relationship that we have that brings about the, uh, the spark of wisdom and the um, kind of enthusiasm for the Dhamma. But that's really what the Dhamma is all about is gaining enthusiasm for it, to gain enthusiasm to... Um, get the mind in a good state 
to bring it out of its uh, hindrances and into and recognizing that the path, the Eightfold Noble Path, is a working path. It works. It actually put it to work. And you can see that it's a set of skills that gain enormous fruit, great fruit, to have these skills. And so that's the enthusiasm that needs to be given to the students so that they can gain, first off, to see that they can find someone that does have the success in it. So we need to have you out there so people can see that the Dhamma works. That's one of the things that we have to have is uh, putting people like yourself on display so that people can see that Dan knows that the Dhamma works. Once we have that, then people will gain faith in it. This is in fact in the suttas in the sense that when someone like the Buddha comes in the world, you've heard it, Dipiti So Bhagawa Eraha Sama Sambuto Icha Charana Sampano Sukuto Lo Gabidu. There's that Lo Gabidu, the knower of the world. So anyway, when someone comes along, it's clear and easy and evident to see it. And it gives people uh, confidence that they can do it too. And then we need to give them something that is immediately good. That's the real issue about the way of the practice is that the Buddha says that it has to be good in the beginning, good in the middle. And good in the end, and it has to be expressed rightly because otherwise people will fall either into wrong view or enemies of, of right noble view. And so it has to be expressed and taught correctly. And when it does, it's good in the beginning, which means that we get immediate benefit. We begin to recognize, oh, that's just dukkha, out it goes, oh, that's anxiety, out it goes, oh, that's anger, out it goes, and just clean house. Keep cleaning house and that stuff comes again. Never mind, out it goes. The Buddha had that phrase, aha, I see you, Mara. <laughs> Very famous phrase, aha, I see you, Mara, and out it goes. So we have to keep changing those thoughts from unwholesome thoughts to wholesome, and we're developing new habits now. At the level of Sankara, we're putting good sewage in and stop using the old sewage. And so over and over again, we, we gained this new uh, practice, but it's built always on shraddha or sada, sada in Pali and shraddha in, in the uh, uh, Sanskrit. And it's often translated as faith, but really it's not. Why? Because faith is blind. It's got no evidence. You got to believe it anyway. But we're not talking about faith. We're talking about absolute knowledge. This stuff works. I can see it in him. And now I can see it in my own mind. And hot diggity dog, I can do this stuff. And now that confidence begins to grow. And so that's the practice of Anapanasati is that development of right noble attitude. And so the Buddha was known to be a lion. Now that's the right attitude, the attitude of a lion. I can handle anything. And I think, um, uh, yeah, I very much appreciate all of that. Uh, really uh, beautiful. And um, I would say that uh, one of the remarkable things, I think when I read about the early Sangha and the great nuns and monks that wandered around with the Buddha and the uh, other practitioners who are wandering around and sadhus and, and people, that there was a tremendous diversity. They would say to the Buddha, this is my interest. This is where I'm coming from. This is what calls to me. And he would look at them and he would say, oh, you're a person who appreciates analysis. You should go study with Sariputta. Your appreciation who is very, very interested in um, sila and uh, the monastic code and right living and knowing that deeply here you should go study with this nun or monk you know you're a person who appreciates deep concentration states that's your path that's your thing and that's what's calling to you you should go study with these people or you know you're you, you know etc and 
there was that sense of an appreciation. There were all these types of beings that had different paths, different karma. And so the problem these days is that we're all in this very, very challenging position where when we put out a podcast like this, it's to a mass audience. And the problem is the diversity of that mass audience, that some will be ready for one thing, some will be ready for another thing. For one person, a teaching might be very limiting. For another person, a teaching might be very empowering. For, a might, for another person, the same teaching might be dangerous or destabilizing. If we say, make you know, effort in the Dharma, they may already be making too much effort. If we say, relax, they may already be relaxing too much. And so the problem is the tuning of that string, right? The tuning of the string that's neither too tight nor too loose. Um, we, we don't know, uh, there, there's no way at, and on mass to be able to tune that right because we don't know for any individual person. And so for those of you listening to this, you have to be able to draw on your own wisdom and say, okay, wait a second, this is where I am. This is what I seem to need. This is someone saying something that seems to be destabilizing. It's causing suffering. It's causing agitation. It's causing comparison or judgment or contraction or you know something aversive or desirous or ignorant. And hopefully have the in the moment wisdom to be able to look at both of you know our points of view and our presentations of the Dharma, which do have some different emphases, and go, this is what is skillful for me, and this is not what's not skillful for me. And if that's that internal um, sense of intuition or wisdom is doesn't seem to be working properly, to hopefully have access to a, a balanced diversity of teachers or spiritual friends on the path who can help to, to shine some light on that and come out with something from all of this that then empowers you to have the best dharma or wisdom or that you possibly can given your resources and conditioning and situation. When you were mentioning about this student being sent to this teacher or that teacher, it reminded me of what so and Mok that that same thing happened there also. And it's an indication that like in the time of the Buddha, it was a big enough established situation so that there were various, uh, let us say, um, qualified, whatever that word means, teachers that uh, were qualified and known enough so that they have students sent to them. Now, that actually is showing what the issues are here in the West, in the sense that even the um, Western Buddhism, uh, the Watts, the Thai Watts that I know quite a lot about in the United States, uh, and also the Lao Watts, various teachers are known. And so monks actually go around in the United States to a lot that they are sent to because of this thing that we're talking about here. And yet there's not enough teachers to go around. Uh, but now we're looking at the issue, well, what about Western Buddhism? We don't have any organization. The teachers don't know each other. They don't know these fineries, or the students certainly don't. You and I are discussing things that are very, very rarely discussed in the English language. But these kind of discussions that we're having happen in Thai language a lot and in Lao, but they don't happen in English. And that is the coming to the agreement of the minds of how can we put these two horses that are absolutely beautiful stallions and put them into a team and get them to work together <laughs> and know each other's um, uh, good qualities, et cetera, like that. And uh, we can help grow the Sangha because now the students know that there are various individual paths and there are teachers available. But this is what I see that's not available um, beyond what is normally referred to as the paid retreat is about the only Buddhism that's available, when in fact what the students really need is a deep, close relationship to a teacher. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. Um, and 
And so in this immature phase where we have the bizarre situation of literally millions of people meditating in various ways or doing other practices that, that have a high degree of meditative quality to them that can get people into um, somewhere into the stages of the progression of the Dharma, which can be confusing existentially, emotionally, um, that can cause feelings of renunciation or feelings of uh, rapture or feelings that they may not how, you know, know how to relate to well or feelings of danger, right? They may see the danger in their worldly life, but they've got kids in a job or in a partner or something. And, and so we don't have a mature society that um, intrinsically has built into it the capacity not only to hand, handle the powers if and when they rely, you know, arise, or a mature conversation about the powers, but all of the rest of the Dharma path, right? Basic mm -hmm. questions of what happens when the powerful tendency towards renunciation arises in a householder, right? We don't have uh, we don't have the sense that that might sometimes be honorable or the necessary family and social supports to even be able to support that process. They don't know where to go. And right. if they choose a, a foreign country that not only do they have the renunciation and the Dhamma, but they've got language difficulties, food difficulties, they've got yes. uh, cultural difficulties, all yes. that kind of stuff. And they're far away from their family. And it it has been, let us say, uh, uh, typically, it's a disaster. Yes, and I, and yet I get we to have a lot all of, of these disasters. And yet we have all of these Western temples in the West that they don't even know about. So we need to make a kind of a connection because I know many monks in the United States by name and, and by conversation and, and that kind of thing. So getting the um, people who want to become a Dhamma teacher, the best way for them to train is go live in the temple. It's only six miles from here, you know. And if you want to start teaching meditation, the Thai monks there or the Asian monks, they will say, sure, go ahead, spend an hour a week and teach some meditation and get something going here and start to bring that Sangha that already exists. There's already a Sangha in the West established by the Asians but their websites are often in some foreign language because they, uh, they cater to being a cultural uh, uh, phenomenon as well. But the Dhamma is there. And so making these connections is something that uh, we can work with. You've got quite a community and quite a lot of connections. And I think that that's what we need to do is work more on the Sangha so that we can solve this underlying question that you brought up and that is is that how can you get good students into good teachers so that they can establish a relationship and start to make the kind of progress because the song i mean in the time of the buddha or in the modern temples you don't just go visit the teacher once or twice a week or go spend 10 days with him every year you move in <laughs> Yeah. So and, I invite whoever wants to come move into my porch. I've got room for three, four people. <laughs> nice. That's very generous. <laughs> and it's not won't be the first time that we've had people. Uh, so in that case, going back to that point, we need to have a community in the West that has the nuance to know that there is the ordinary, the mundane, and the magical that ripens and ripens and clinging and has all of these problems with it, as well as the super mundane. That there are levels to it, and that students need to be taught at the level they're at. And I understand that. And in a way, I'm kind of disagreeing with Bhikkhu Buddha Dasu, who says that I don't care if he's at the ordinary level. I'm going to grab him by the collar and teach him what for. And if you don't like it, he can leave. And if he does, he's good to stay. And the other thing one has to be careful about when implementing that solution, which I think is, is an excellent thing to add to the mix of what's going on, is that when one approaches these temples, uh, that are coming from the Asian cultures, one will often find a lot of the things that you've just been in some ways railing against. 
One will find, you know, paintings on the wall of the Buddha flying through the air or talking to Dewas or, you know, pushing away, you know, or stopping Anugi Mala or, you know, doing all these things. Like, I, I how many temples and have I walked whatever into? Whatever kind of beautiful place do you expect the nobles to live other than a magical paradise such as that? That's why sure. the temples are that way. They're not there, by the way, for the monks. Those temples are done that way for the people. Yes, of course. And so, so th then this requires actually a relatively mature understanding and relationship to religiosity, to ceremony, to incense and candles. I, I remember um, one of my teachers was talking about, I think it was Buddha Dasa may have said something like, like I, I think it was, I can't remember, something like, you know, lighting uh, candles and burning incense is for thumb sucking kids on the spiritual path, right? Which was simultaneously, there are some people who could benefit from that, but other, but other people might be totally offensive and alienating and really fail to recognize something that could, if related to maturely and with wisdom, be a beautiful expression of devotion, just making a place nice and a place conducive to peaceful, beautiful Dharma. And so, so as we relate but to religiosity- But step one of the path, of course we want them to do that, to learn to have some respect for their environment. Let's put a Buddha Rupa around someplace. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that much of a heretic. <laughs> there you go, nice Naga. There you go, I like it. There you go. So we have a giant magical snake over the Buddha in a statue. It's not a magical snake. Those are the seven factors of enlightenment. That's the Sambojana that he uses for protection. The snake part of it is only a uh, metaphorical representation of giving him protection. I hear you. Um, and then there are some and people me who too, actually. By the way, I got a snake here. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Um, and so, you know, we have to be very careful with our relationship to religious and magical teachings. And on the, the one hand, to encourage a mature relationship to them, to call them out when they're causing suffering or for people to regress on the path or get stuck on the path, but also to be able to, in the same breath, be able to be supportive of the faith, of the generosity, of the beauty, of the, 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 the interior design magic, the aesthetics, and what that mm -hmm. all represents, and that that can, for many people, be a source of great inspiration sometimes to practice well rather than um, to get stuck. And so, to have that mature conversation and that mature relationship and be able to do that, that's the kind of nuance that I think we need in the West. And, and so, and, and in the Asian countries as well, if we can manage to swing it. And then we run into the problem that some people having it presented one way, like will, will react badly to that. And then you present it the other way and they might re react badly to that. And it's, and so that's the problem with mass dharma rather than the individual relationship that can see imbalances and help to lend some more maturity to that. Mm -hmm. And again, masses is hard to teach mass friendship. Yes. Always friendship is done at an individual level. It's hard enough to teach it at an individual level. A mass level is really hard to do. That's true. Also, here, even the teacher getting his breath in sync with the student's breath is hard to do when there's a whole lot of students. Easier sure. to do when there's just one student there to get in sync with them. Magically, I like it. It's good. And so um, the other thing I will say is a lot of, um, because what one sees if one doesn't know the language and the culture and in walking into the Asian temples is the magic is the ritual, are the gold statues or the beautiful decorations, are the incense, are the, all, all of those trappings, which can, again can be beautiful, a beautiful expression of the appreciation of the Dhamma and its wisdom. Um, but a lot of Westerners walking into those settings, having come from a secular 
mind having come from a materialist way of looking, having come from some other religious tradition that may look at that in some way as superstition or something, right? Which some of it is, right? Uh, validly, you know, is is actually um, a hindrance or a problem or a distraction from the Dharma, right? And so, um, but but to be able to come in and know that there's also the deep wisdom there, because I think what's sometimes lost is um, that there's the belief that, oh, these are just sort of religious temples. They're basically like a church. They're basically like a, um, just a, a place for rites and rituals, which one shouldn't cling to. And to, to forget that and there the may be- Thai food in town. Well, also that, but that there may be also some very, very deep noble practitioners there who Precisely are deeply so. established in the Dharma, both in theory and practice, and um, have grown up in a mature community that nourished by those kinds of teachings may have its own wisdom of Sangha, of support, of, of, of helping everybody right. on the path. Right. So that multi-level that you're talking about then needs to be incorporated in the educational system so that people will know uh, that there is, in fact, more to the temple than literally meets the eye. And not only that, but that's what Buddhism looks like to the Western world is what the appearance is, what they see bowing and scraping and all of that kind of stuff is, is basically um, all that is there. But there's the other part, and that is, is that there is a lot of people who are actually already interested in the Dhamma, and they're, in, they're thirsty for the Dhamma. They would like to have a teacher, but then they will avoid those temples because they think that all they will be there will be that Dhamma of the uh, ordinary people, the, uh, the magic and the rituals and all of that, and not recognize that the higher Dhamma is available to them. That uh, uh, So we have organizations, you perhaps are familiar with the term, they call it pragmatic Dhamma. And one <laughs> of the ideas of the pragmatic Dhamma, so I understand, is, is that they say, well, you know, all of this stuff that we've gotten from Buddhism, from Asia and whatnot has grown into Western Buddhism. It's got some inherent problems. And if we can find what those problems are and tweak it and fix it, then we'll have something really great. And what they're missing is, is the fact that the missing ingredients that they're looking for are not missing in Thailand. Many, many thousands of people in Thailand know what those missing ingredients are. And one of those missing ingredients is step 10 of Anapanasati. That's the key ingredient, which could be said if you wanted to hear it from Mary Poppins' point of view, a teaspoon of sugar will help the medicine go down. <laughs> and this is what we mean by this teaspoon of medicine is in uh, a teaspoon of sugar is in fact the gladdening the mind the nurturing of the mind to allow yourself to be okay the way that you are that we don't need anything that we're good to go we're comfortable and secure and happy now that's a quite a lump of sugar there that's sukha in pity and if we would practice it and give us ourselves that we could become satisfied and whole within the Dhamma. And really there's not much to the, pra the, the pragmatic Dhamma. Just sit down, shut up and be happy. That's all there is to it. <laughs> <laughs> I delight in the vision of that simplicity. Um, and uh, it, it would be wonderful if I was able to believe that it was, in fact, for all um, in this complicated world, that simple. But it is a beautiful vision, it and is, I applaud it. But it takes us a long time to actually do that. We do all of this other stuff instead. And so we spend years thinking that we're going to sit down, shut up, and be happy, and we don't. We think sure. that we've got to wait for the common machine to put in 24,000 hours of meditation. And then the common machine is going to waltz in with his Shakti pot and spray us with the holy water. And then we can be happy. But until <laughs> then, I got to wait on it. <laughs> I got nice. to do composite really hard. I got to get a whole bunch of concentration and then I can be happy. Yeah, I think 
one of the things we're going to have to do on our side is help a lot of the Asian temples to appreciate the best signaling methods such that they can say, hey, there is some wisdom here. There is some depth here. There are some true practitioners here. There are some noble ones here. There are some people with an understanding and wisdom to share and to figure out a way to signal that that is also respectful of their own culture and its taboos and its subtleties. You right? would be and surprised at how anxious some of these old abbots are. And when I talk about that, let me explain something to you. Above all else that the Westerners don't understand about Asians, the Asians know the distinctions between a good monk and a not a good monk. And if they're going to pay through the transportation and the visas and all of that to house monks in the United States, they want really high quality monks and they know what they're looking for. I've actually been on expeditions from the United States to Thailand, monk hunting in <laughs> Cambodia. <laughs> nice. And so this whole idea then that there are nobles because they're sought out, that, that you don't have like the run of the mill temple in Thailand may have one noble occasionally, maybe one or two per village or worse than that, maybe one or two per province but they collect in hordes in the United States because they're well-known. And they cycle through some of the really, really well-known monks. And some of them are Jao Kun and have high uh, ranking within the Thai Sangha or the uh, Laotian Sangha. So we've got a lot. And here's the next point that's most important. And that is, is that they are genuinely interested in fulfilling their duty to the Dhamma with the Westerners. They are eager to have Westerners come, but they don't know what to do with them and they don't speak English and that kind of stuff. And so the issue is cultural and language, as well as the fact that the Dhamma itself is so hidden away among all the trappings of the religion of Buddhism. And so, so that's, that's, but that doesn't make it unsurmountable as an issue. In fact, we've already had one very good success story. His name is Eric. And uh, Robert, who is in here in Thailand and knows some monks in the United States, and we got together in, with our monk network and got Eric installed in the Seattle Watt during the COVID uh, times. And he stayed there for months and months and months. And he came out just the shining toy. He is so beautiful. And he got pretty well scrubbed clean in, in Seattle at the temple there. And this nice. is available. We've got one example already. And so the next guy that we can get, anybody who wants to uh, be really interested and dedicated to the Dhamma board, we have a few watts for you to hang out in. Nice. And so I think I could easily imagine like an app, like there's, you know, there's an app band is in town and it tells you when your the bands that you like, the musical bands or whatever are coming to your area in the same way, it would be great if there was like an app that had a tour schedule such that you would know when this, uh, you know, uh, Dharma practitioner or teacher or nun or monk or whatever was on tour or going to be visiting a particular place or going to be, be in residence for a while, that this was someone who had wisdom to share. And so you could have almost like a, a map or like a, with like, you know, or tour routes, you know, so some central clearinghouse for that in the same way that this is published for touring um, entertainment. Rather packs. than tracking teachers, I would prefer it be easierly done by tracking the watch. Because hmm. we know where they are. Well, so right. again, and most people don't. So I think there's still this tremendous uh, sort of veil that still lives over that world where it's very hard to access. So for example, there's a Mahasi Center um, in New Jersey, and I just sent a, 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 someone who wanted to give a donation to uh, a center like that, and they were wondering to which center should we donate. And that was the one I pointed them to, but the website is entirely in Burmese. 
right? And <laughs> curious, and but still like there's contact information and address. So hopefully they could get in touch with them if they wish to. But it, it's, it's a real cultural barrier in some ways. And so um, those kinds of issues are still quite real. And in terms of doing some magic in the world, uh, magic <laughs> to lift those veils, magic mm -hmm. to create the Sangha, magic to create those connections and to empower people to be able to find the wisdom and the people that can support it. I think that would be some great magic for us all to figure out how to engage in. I, I there are some plans afoot. Yes, I, I know. And I'm very thankful that you're working on some of that. <laughs> well, I very much appreciate this conversation. I think that we can uh, uh, finish off with this. I really have enjoyed this, Dan. It's been delightful, as always. <laughs> Steve, That's, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, yes, I'm here. Guys, this was so fascinating and so interesting. Many points of agreement and many interesting and civilized disagreements and uh, exchanges of opinion, I think. So wonderful. I have one question, if you like before we wrap. And that is, that's a couple of times now, Damarato, you were saying to Daniel uh, that he uh, is an example of the, the Dharma works and it takes one to know one and so on. And there was, seemed to be some sort of mutual nodding and smiling going on. And I'm wondering <laughs> what it is that you're recognizing in each other there. Is it uh, a doctrinal or practice uh, consonance? Or are you uh, recognizing some kind of spiritual attainment, for example? Uh, what is it exactly that there seemed to be some sort of Dharma code going on there? Can you decrypt it for us? I'm shy. I am less shy. So, <laughs> <laughs> But as actually a monastic, you're supposed to be shy with regard to that. That's actually your, it's, it's part of the code, right? Explicitly. Mm -hmm. And so a certain shyness with regard to that is a part of the, that noble part of the path, right? And mm -hmm. so it's, it's a lot of things. It's, it's shorthand for a spirit. Um, it's shorthand for an ethic. It's shorthand for the appreciation of the generosity of freely given Dharma. It's, it's a, a, a recognition of a deep reverence for the transformational power of these teachings. It's a re reverence for um, a profound sense of trying to get this right as best we can, knowing what we know and given the conditioning that we have. It's, it's a profound recognition of an ability to return again and again to key points that cut through, that get to the heart of the matter. And it's, it's a recognition for a life uh, dedicated to that, lived in the service of that, delighting in that, finding the joy in that, that, um, that sense of flowing um, uh, reverence and dedication. I think that's what it is. And the establishment of that, that is reflected in a life that is dedicated to the teachings of the Dhamma and the wisdom. Um, and uh, a natural resonance on those fronts. Would, would, does that sound fair? Yeah. It, um, Achan Po has said that no one knows the mind of another person. And that's, that's true. We don't really know what's in the mind, but we can see behavior. We can see joy. We can see all the outward manifestations of what the mind is doing, but we really don't know what's going on inside one's mind. Along with that, Achan Po said that it takes time in both, in both regards. In one regard, it takes time in the sense that if you are inspecting someone, if you want to check them out, it takes a while. It doesn't happen immediately. You have to see a consistency there. And that consistency is best seen in the light of hardship. In other words, do they have sea legs? Do they have that upeka that we were talking about so that we can handle that wave when it comes and hits the boat? <laughs> <It doesn't laughs> run us overboard. 
<laughs> we've got our sea legs. So that's one of the ways of doing it is that it takes a while. And in fact, I'd like to digress just a moment to talk about, um, I got a telephone call from one of my friends who is a resident, a long-term resident at Watso and Mo, and that she was calling to complain about one of these old senior monks had been on the boat with an elder layman and that she overheard their conversation in Thai and they were talking about Achan Po being an Arahat. And she didn't understand that. And I had to explain to her that there are a set of procedures that if in fact we have these fetters, that over time you can look to see, does this person uh, demonstrate life in a certain way. For instance, Achan Po, and we'll use him as an example, has never been seen angry. I don't know anybody who's ever seen Achan Po angry. Not only that, but he's never asked for anything. He's already content with the way things are. So he doesn't ask for anything. He's never in a hurry. He will stay with you just as long as you have wanting to stay with him. He'll be there. He doesn't say, well, I got to go now or somebody else who's calling or whatever, he'll just stay there. He's not in a hurry to go anywhere. And so these are marks of, uh, that can be seen. And another one would be friendliness in the sense that he doesn't compete with any of the other monks. He doesn't talk down about them or, uh, um, here's another example of this is that people, because he's the abbot of what's so and more, people come to him to complain about everything that goes wrong at the temple. And you know what he does about nothing? Because he knows that if people are complaining to him about the problem, they'll probably complain to some other monk who's willing to go do something. And so he lets things happen. Sage and very mage. Natural, huh? Sage and mage. Mm -hmm. So he lets things go like that. So this is one of the ways of seeing that we can tell who is whom but we can't do it because of hearsay or because of um, um, something that uh, they say or do or because of a following or whatnot like that, but that it takes a while to see. But then on the other side of that is, is that, well, what about my own remarks or uh, my place in the sense of how am I doing there? And the answer would be that I reflect upon, well, it's been about five years since I was angry, so I must be doing pretty well on that issue. And then, yeah, I don't have much materialism left. I'm pretty good with that. And so I can go and check this one off and that one off. And I come to conceit. Whoa, oh, look at that. <laughs> I need to look at that one. <laughs> or anxiety or whatever like that. And so these fetters of anxiety, which is actually another word for restlessness, restlessness, guilt, remorse, um, competition, uh, fear, anger, all of these things can be inspected within oneself. This is why it's called the uh, enlightenment factor of investigation. You keep looking, you keep looking, you keep looking. What is there? Inspect. How are you doing? What's things going? And when we do it like that, we become more and more satisfied. Well, you know, I'm, things are good now. Everything's okay. Wait a minute. Let me check again. Yeah, everything's okay. <laughs> Let me check again. Yeah, everything's okay. <laughs> so we become like a night watchman. We keep opening one eye and check everything's fine, and then we're good to go. And then open the eye again, everything's fine, and we're good to go. So this is a way of, of the practice, but that practicing is um, a way of doing Anapanasati from the very beginning. The very first beginner does the same thing. This is not an advanced practice. It's the same practice. We just keep getting better at it because we keep practicing it over and over again. So for the very beginner, everything is okay. Everything is fine. No worries, no problems. Everything is good. And so if we practice that way, then we'll get someplace. Unfortunately, our system, our whole world is around attainment. 
that they own the Reddit in places or talking about spiritual attainment here, there, and the other thing. And any attainment that any student wants is a sure sign that he doesn't have what he needs because he'll tell you. (laughs) (laughs) What do I need? I need what I want. And so when we stop wanting and we don't need anything. And so this can be seen is when people become satisfied with their life. Everything is okay. Everything's fine. Which means no competition because everybody's already okay. We don't have to compete anymore. I won all. I I mean, I won every match. There's no reason to keep competing with people because I've won every one of them. (laughs) (laughs) I get tired of competing because I'm always the winner. (laughs) And so we get up, we give up these things because we recognize that competition is a lot of work. And what have I proved? Because I haven't convinced anybody but myself that I'm okay. So why should I keep comparing? So this is a way of looking at it. How do we know? We know because we look and we keep looking. And when we look and we know what we're looking for, we can see. On a slightly but related but somewhat unrelated topic, I think one of the things that is I've noticed in this dialogue is an emphasis on monks and monasticism. And I think one of the aspects of magical thinking that has not been as helpful for some of the Asian countries is the notion that be- because the bhikkhuni sangha of nuns died out, that it shouldn't be resurrected, that only nuns could ordain nuns, for example. And I think that is a kind of magical thinking that in some ways is a source of unhappiness and disempowerment and um, that that path is much more challenging for uh, females who you know are called out to the renunciate life i think there's a lot of unhappiness there and by the obvious lack of cultural material support and respect in the same kind of way and so speaking of magical thinking that I think is unhelpful, um, you know, the Dharma is the Dharma, wisdom is the wisdom, impermanence is the impermanence, you know, the transmission of that wisdom um, is... Impermanence you know, is impermanence regardless of its genitals? My goodness. Yes. So there we go. And so <laughs> I think that, you know, we, we've mentioned lots about monks being, you know, monk hunting, but the fact that there are very few um, are almost no nuns to hunt at all, other than some, you know, some clearly very accomplished, you know, um, uh, you know, ten precept nuns in white, who a lot of whom have very skillful and powerful dharma. So, for example, um, and uh, but often are very marginalized and underestimated. And I think that's an aspect of religious um, and cultural thinking that has not been a friend to the dharma, unfortunately, for slightly over half of the population. Um, and so, for example, um, up in, I have a monastic friend who's in a, a monastery where there were just three um, monks. Now they're just two. But um, one of the people there attained to stream entry and had a friend who was a 10 precept uh, person who would be a nun if they were ordaining nuns in that tradition, but lives a renunciate life wearing white. And the stream enterer, um, knowing the wisdom of this nun and knowing her to be a more advanced noble one, um, went to study with her, even though uh, from a cultural point of view was not as revered, but um, he and the abbot of the monastery recognized her wisdom. And, um, and then after his stream entry, he went to study with this nun. And those, that kind of magical thinking that culturally disempowers a whole half of the population, I think is the kind of magical thinking that also needs to be spoken out against, because that's a lot of people um, with a lot of potential for uh, wisdom and development, that the tradition can be obviously very frankly alienating 
too, because of this cultural factor. And I, I hope that, that that's one of the elements that the West in our ability to see through sometimes selective aspects of magical thinking uh, will help um, the Asian traditions remember and be more comfortable with. So hopefully we can learn from each other in that regard. All right. Well, let me at least take this opportunity to speak out against it. <laughs> and possibly, possibly the way to go with that is, is that the issue that you're describing now is very much the same thing that happened in the United States with the Civil War. The Civil War effectively, legally ended slavery, but it didn't end racism. Okay. The Bakuni issue has been solved. That was solved and was put to bed in the mid 90s through Taiwan. And now there are dozens and dozens, maybe a hundred women who have ordained as bhikkhunis in Sri Lanka, in Burma, in Thailand. In fact, there's quite a large monastery in, in Ayutthaya that originally was nothing but Mechis. And that the abbot of that monastery an old Meiji went to Taiwan, got fully ordained, took some time or some Thai monks went there for her ordination to make sure that they've got it. And then she came back and now there's dozens and dozens, but that's not the only monastery in Thailand now that is have a, has an abbot as a bhikkhuni. Now that's an issue. And the issue is because that you have to be fully ordained for 20 years before you could be an abbot. And so that means that she was kind of abbot in kind of name only, or there was, a, or let us say that there was a nominal monk who was the abbot of that Wat, but he never came there because this nun was effectively of the abbot. Now she's fully because she's been a monk for more than 20 years or a bhikkhuni for more than 20 years. She's now a full abbot with all of the duties for now ordaining women. I mean, it's a done deal. That cat, that cat is out of the bag. And a lot of people don't know it. They don't know it. They sort don't know of. that war is over. They're like the racists who are still clinging to slavery when in fact it's illegal now. <laughs> But culturally, there is still, I think, it's nothing. That's what like, I'm getting at. Not in not just in the West, right. it's in Thailand too. It's all over the place. Yeah, nothing at all balanced. So, and that's part of the issue. Also, on another level that I'm thinking about is exactly the same thing happened with the bhikkhunis that broke off from Achan Cha. And, so, and started their own monastery in Southern California. And they say, oh, well, there must have been some sort of rift. No, it was time to go. 20 years as a bhikkhuni, and now she's going to go start something on her own. That's the way that it's uh, supposedly done. And so, like I said, that cat's been out of the bag for so long that, you know, that was, what, 25 years ago. So we've got bhikkhunis now that are up there at the top so that they can now officially on their own with the help of the monks ordain women fully. The issue, by the way, with Achan Brahm was is that he was doing the right thing with wrong procedures, but there were some other issues. And even but I, would, I don't want to go nature. too much into the monks' politics, but yeah. but uh, I, I do want to say that um, yes, here's another point, and that is is that in the West the chauvinism is seen. In Thailand, the issue is not the kuni or not the kuni. The issue is the do is the noble dhamma open to women. The answer to that is certainly yes. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of women that are in the various stages of the Mechi, depending upon how they dress. Some of them have black skirts and a white blouse. Some of them shave their heads. Some of them are fully white. All of those kinds of things. But um, there was a very famous Mechi at Watsuan Mok. Her name was Achan Ranchuan. And people from all over the place came to hear her talk. She was, she was a star. And so there have been 
a lot of women that that are well known, but um, the feminists come in and say equality, 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 when in fact the equality to the ties is not the issue. Here's something that a lot of people don't understand about Thailand. Thailand is a matriarchal culture anyway. It's deeply matriarchal. The women, especially the grandmothers, run this country, even though they give the appearance that the men do. But this is actually something that goes deep into the Dhamma. There is a sutta number 31 in the Ding and the Kaya that, that gives advice to laymen. And one of the advices to the layman is, is that let your wife have the family business. You don't, you, you can still be a householder, but you devote your time to the Dhamma. You spend most of your time over at the Wat. It's only across the way over there. And let the household and all of the business be done by the wife. And that's one of the reasons why I've been able to fit into Sai society so well as I let my wife be the boss. She really is the boss and she's quite good at it, which means I don't have to do anything. Now, if you take that to the grand scale, really, even the men who are the um, elders and the, let us call them deacons, for lack of any other word, at the what? who go and do the watch business in behalf of the monks because the monks don't do any of the accounting or the buying or the selling or anything for the watch. That's always done by a board of directors. But guess who tells each individual member on that board of directors what to do? His wife. The wives ultimately won the show. And so they're quite content to let the men have all the glory and be all in the orange robes when the women run the country already anyway, and they run their homes. Another example of that is, is that when there is a divorce, which is kind of rare, then the grandmothers have the children. In the West, one parent or the other is responsible for the kids. In Thailand, the grandmothers own the kids. Mostly the, the, the boys will go to the mother of the father and that the girls will go to the mother of the mother but that's not always the case it depends upon uh finances and school locations and all of that kind of stuff but these grandmothers even though they're uh the, their children the husband and wife have separated those two grandmothers are still thick as thieves because they've both got the duty of taking care of those kids and not only that, but we don't need the government to enforce the um, um, uh, child support laws because if my mom's taking care of my kids, I better pay my mom to take care of my kids. I don't need the government to tell me to take care of my kids. Mom's going to do it for me. She's going to tell me to take care of my kids. And so, and I see that happening a lot in Thailand. And so there's an equality that the women have that transcends what color of the robes do they wear in Thailand? And so anybody who's got any magical ideas that orange is better than white, just they don't understand the complexity of the situation. <laughs> I agree it's clearly complicated and not everything translates straightforwardly. And I very much appreciate the descriptions of all of the counterbalancing issues of power and role and all that. And I uh, presume it must be a great system when it works and when everybody is capable and has the resources and the grandmothers are living and, and people all get along and are comfortable with all of those power dynamics. Um, uh, I would just guess that it's also not a perfect system with its flaws and I its issues. No and people system who, is perfect who definitely might appreciate it, it could be some other way. So I think hopefully that will be an ongoing conversation that will help um, refine how these different points of view might interact in skillful ways. Let us hope that those conversations lead to understanding and not to fix jobs, not patchwork. I'm not interested in fixing a system that's way bigger than I am. I'm interested Fair. in just enjoying the show. All right. Fair enough. Because <laughs> I can't fix it, but I can fit in quite well. Then, in fact, that's very much the mentality in Thailand. You see, in the West, we have this idea of 
social climbing, that your ladder to success is a ladder and you've got to climb out of your social structure into more money, higher position, more letters after your name and all of that kind of stuff. And it's a struggle. In Thailand, it's seen much more of as a network and every individual's job is to fit into their niche in the network. That that's all that one is required to do is to fit in to society. Where you are is good enough. This is where you were born. I mean, you can see the magical beliefs in there, but it sure is a whole lot better than struggling for stuff we don't have like the Westerners have. The ties are automatically right in there to be comfortable and content with what you've got. Everything's fine. I can see both tremendous beauty and both tremendous trouble from that sort of attitude, both. Um, just like the caste system, uh, you know, in India has caused uh, tremendous trouble and complexity. And was recently um, reading yet another article. Funny about... how Buddhism is a solution to that, because if you join yeah. the Dan Sangha, that there is no more caste. That's one of the reasons why the Sangha was wiped out in India is because the people who wanted to have control over it wanted to use that caste system as a way of controlling people, divide and conquer and that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, it's obviously been a very complex history. Um, Guru Viking, we've wandered far from the topics of magic, but had a lot of fun. What are your thoughts on all this? Well, yeah, it's it's just been such a tremendous dialogue. I think so rich and a great example of the possibilities, actually, of dialogues like this. You, I think both of you have agreed on many points. And as I said before, had very rich, civilized and intelligent disagreements also and comparing of opinion and all in good faith. So I think it's just a tremendous uh, example and really thrilling uh, to uh, be a part of it and to listen to you both talking in this way. I did promise two minutes each of sum up. That might be redundant now, but I want, I do want to offer it to you. Two minutes Please each Please redund away. <laughs> okay, so Damarato, would you like to take uh, two minutes for your sum up and then Daniel, I'll offer the opportunity to you if you'd like it. I would sum up by saying that the Buddha's teachings are very simple. He even expressed it as Dukkha, Dukkha Naroda. There are many ways to save the Buddha, the entire teachings of the Buddha, in just one small little sentence. It's always easy to pack right up. An example of that is um, um, Gawanka had the expression, never mind, start again. And you can see that um, nurturing quality to that. And I like the one, don't worry, be happy. But all of these are just one expression of the entire teaching of the Buddha, but it's not um, worry, worry, worry for a long time, and then later, don't worry, be happy. It's right now, don't worry, be happy. Or it's not dukkha, dukkha, look at dukkha, uh, inspect dukkha, uh, have a whole lot of insight into dukkha, and someday you'll be free from dukkha. But rather the teaching is see the dukkha right now and come out of it right now. That's the teaching of the Buddha, this present moment. So may this present moment be joyful for you. Amarato, thank you very much. Daniel, your sum up. I would just like to say extremely grateful for these kinds of conversations, for your providing the opportunity for these sorts of dialogues and for all the work that's involved in producing a podcast. Uh, Damarato, for your time, your wisdom, your sense of humor, your compassion, your spirit, uh, it's, it, it, your knowledge um, and deep interest in, and love of these topics. So i uh, just like to say, this has just been a lot of fun. And I hope that people are able to take this and hold it in that same spirit of uh, appreciation, but holding it lightly, such that it doesn't become a thicket of views or suffering or division or harm, but instead one is able to see what uh, it has some benefit for oneself in one that one's own mind and heart and body in that moment and to let go of anything that's causing suffering from this, that's causing division or confusion or 
um, any of that and to be able to be a light unto oneself um, in uh, simultaneously, hopefully, a collective of people journeying on the path together towards wisdom, uh, kindness, and uh, a good and skillful world. So thank you. Daniel Ingram and Damarata, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.